All right, good evening, everyone. This is the uh, Calabasas Planning Commission meeting of April 21, 2021. Uh, first, I, I want to note that all the commissioners are present except for uh, the chair, Wendy Fassberg, who has recused herself, so she uh, so her absence is excused. Um, then we're going to go to the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and maybe, John, could you lead us in that? Sure, sure. <clears throat> We're going to get the, there's the flag. Okay. Hand yeah. over your heart and begin. I pledge, I allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the, flag the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. 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 So next is the uh, uh, announcements. Do any commissioners have any announcements? Or I'm sorry, it's actually approval of agenda. Is anybody opposed to the agenda? Is, is it approved? Can we just say it's approved? So moved. Second. Second. All those uh, in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, announcements. Are there any announcements besides tomorrow being Earth Day, I believe? Nothing here. No. Uh, anybody else, Dennis? No? Okay. Uh, then we have oral communications for anyone who wishes to comment on something that's not on the agenda, not relating to West Village. Are there any people, uh, any participants there who would like to speak on something other than West Village? And if so, I guess play, uh, raise your hand on, on Zoom. Mr. Chairman, we have two hands up, um, Anita McQuillan and Diana Coronado, but uh, I'm not sure if they're speaking. Um, I'm going to allow Anita, who didn't speak last week, see if she wants to speak during public comment. I'm going to allow her to speak. All right. Anita, are you speaking under um, this section of the agenda or under West Village? Anita? I'm speaking under West Village. Okay, then uh, we'll, we'll call you later then. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Mari, you said had somebody else or? Uh, she lowered her hand because she oh, spoke last week. Okay, all right, so let me make just a sort of a general announcement of how we're gonna handle the meeting tonight. Uh, first, we're going to have, um, I'm gonna, I'm reopening the public hearing. And um, first we're going to hear from the public and uh, then we're going to uh, continue hearing for those members, uh, th those members of the public who have not spoken before. So we'll give them an opportunity. There's two minutes. Um, this would be a lot easier if we were in person uh, because I would have speaker cards and I could announce who the next person is and I could announce who the people, who the following speakers were so they could all get ready, but we can't do that. And uh, Matt and I both thought there was a two minute timer um, last week and it turns out there wasn't one. So um, on a lose call time after two minutes, you know, in person, it's a lot nicer because you have a light that goes on a few seconds before the end of your time. And then again, at the end of your time, and usually we allow people to finish their sentences and their thoughts. And if the commissioners want, uh, want to chime in on any speaker, they can do so. So anyway, um, so you've got two minutes to speak and this is for speakers who uh, who didn't have the opportunity to speak last week. And then, um, then we're going to, um, uh, th th then the staff, I believe, is uh, presenting, um, uh, 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 they're, they're presenting a presentation and then the applicants can respond as well. And then we can close the public hearing and the commissioners can ask the staff or ask the, the applicant for, uh, if they have questions and then um, then finally, the commissioners will be able to speak, uh, present their comments, and then we'll try to deliberate and come up with some sort of solution. So um, with that in mind, so let's begin with the speakers who haven't uh, spoken, and we're in a public hearing, but uh, Mari is handling it now. Thank you. So Mr. Chair, I'm calling on Anita McQuinn okay. again. All right. Thank you. Anita, please state your name and the city you live in and you'll have two minutes to address the uh, commission. It's Anita McQuillan. I live in the city of Calabasas, and I actually wanted more information about the landslide removal project. 
Um, I heard Gregory Byrne giving a presentation, but he was cut off. So he is a neighbour of mine. I asked him for, the, for more clarification. And this is a statement that he made. It is important to note that the same consultant that did extensive work on the West Village property eventually became the consultant of record for the colony. That firm got the colony approved without ever touching the landslide or changing the debris basin. Even Lawson Geotechnical, who provided the second party review to support developers' position to do the remedial grading, said that the chances for impact to the colony or Las Virginas Road due to gross or superficial stability on the West Village site without the landslide remediation was slight. Developer is bringing back exactly the same project that was voted down last time. Developer refuses to consider any alternative that does not involve the remedial landslide grading. Developer bought a lot with a well-documented geologic hazard, and he is attempting to use that defect in the land to persuade you to give him a project. I disagree that there are no other alternatives to the landslide removal project. There is plenty of flat pad located well away from the toe of the landslide that can be safely developed. The grading will destroy one of the more visible hillsides in the city, remove heritage oak trees, bury natural springs, further obstruct, obstruct an already narrow wildlife corridor, and place 180 family units right in the middle of a high fire hazard zone with already poor and restricted ingress and egress. Excuse me, Anita, your time is up. Your time is up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Next, um, uh, Cynthia Maxwell. Cynthia, please go ahead. Cynthia, please state your name in the city you live in, please. Well, Cynthia, are you, are you yeah. there? We can come back to Cynthia if, if you wish. Okay, I'll mute her, okay. Uh, Linda Lohill. Hello, uh, commissioners. Uh, good evening, my name is Linda Lohill. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I just wanted to tell you about uh, my relationship with the Yerba Buena plant that is a very unique wildflower that is uh, in the wetlands behind the West Village uh, site. I am uh, passionate about wildflowers. I've done a lot of research about wildflowers for years. I've also uh, cycled around the Santa Monica Mountains and hiked for many years. I volunteer uh, over 300 hours every year with a mountain bike group. I learned about the Yerba Mansa as I was doing research. Uh, I learned that it's an important medicinal plant. Uh, its tea was valid, valued among the Native Americans as a healing wash for cuts, sores, and venereal diseases. It was also used in a ritual purifying ceremony. It was a very, very important plant to them. I had been looking for this yerba buena plant for many years. It's a unique looking, it's, it's very big. It's the size of a small child's hand. It has white flowers that radiate out in this uh, center pistol that sort of looks like a acorn that's dipped in white icing. It's pretty amazing. After many months of looking, I finally found it and it's in the wetlands right behind uh, the West Village site. It's a beautiful area. There's a tremendous variety of uh, fauna and flora. And I feel this is a very important reason to keep uh, the site native to the way it is. And I just wanted to share my story with you about that. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can I ask Linda a question if she's still on? Oh, sure. Go ahead. She's still there, Mari? Yes, she's there. Hi, uh, hi, Ms. Lowhill. Thank you for your comments. Um, 
I'm curious whether the Yerba Buena plant was impacted by the uh, fire or is it come back or not impacted at all, if you know. I, uh, I read a letter, but um, I've heard from Tom Haydock who sent in a letter to you guys and he said he saw it there a few months ago and he says uh, he was thrilled to see that it had survived the fires. And that's probably because it's a wet land and there's some natural uh, springs there and they've probably been able to preserve the flora in that location. Thank you, Linda. If you, uh, if anyone asks me really nicely, I will take them there to see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, we're gonna allow uh, Cynthia Maxwell again. Hopefully uh, we can. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Oh, good. I forgot to plug in my Zoom. Okay, Cynthia Maxwell, I live in Cold Creek. Okay, um, I'm calling this, I'm reading this record, a letter from Save Open Space, Santa Monica Mountains. And we oppose the West Village development proposal, proposal as it violates and is inconsistent with the laws, policies, and ordinances of the city of Calabasas. In, specifically, the, the, it is inconsistent with the zoning order in, ordinance, the city's general plan, the scenic corridor guidelines, the hillside development standards, Lost Virginia's gateway like guidelines, and it's also part of a critical habitat linkage, linkage mapped in the, in the natural resource management plan of the SS, SMM NRA issued in 1982. Um, the other thing is that the uh, this plan is 50% in, in OSDR uh, zoning and development is, is open space and development is restricted through deed restriction, conservation easement or dedication. More than 50% of this prop property is um, in the Baldwin deed restricted open space. Um, on a, also on page 44, please properly disclose to the public by correcting the zoning map by putting the OSDR designation inside the yellow boundary site, see attachment three. So I think that we really need to look at this because it's so uh, against what is already in place as part of the protection of this land. Thank you, Cynthia. Next, we have Jennifer Hoffman. Jennifer, please state your name in the city you live in. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hoffman. I live in here in Calabasas. And I am the executive director of a, a nonprofit organization. It's, um, we have programs all over the world, mainly in the country, but all over. We've run about $50 million of donations through the organization that's headquartered here in Old Town Calabasas. And I moved my charity here in 2009 because of the alignment of values with environmental uh, initiatives that the city had taken. But in the past five years, there's been some deviation. Um, and that's forced me to become more involved than I thought I would. And my statement on New Home Company is that they made a poor choice in purchasing this piece of land for the type of development they want there. It just doesn't work. The hillside that they want to tear down was already designated as protected open space in 2008, prior to the purchase of their land in 2012. And now new home company wants to the city to approve taking away 20 acres of open space to serve their private interests. And the residents, we've already voiced our opinion on this matter in 2016. Um, I was there, I served as the treasurer on the no enough campaign in which we overturned the council's approval of this very same project. And the planning commission already denied this project in 2019, but here we are again. And the residents are ready to show up again. We don't want this development and we're not going away. If this matter is put to a public vote in accordance with Measure M as it should be, then the public will once again vote to reject any change to the open space zoning on this land parcel. I mean, the developer had a responsibility to vet the land before they purchased it. And it's not our problem that they made a poor decision um, with what they have to work with. We will not allow protected open space to be destroyed for the private the benefit of private interest and financial gain. And I, I urge you to vote to deny this project. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we have Kim and Kelly Spadoni. So I don't know which of them will speak. So we'll allow them to talk. Hmm. Two for one. <laughs> Kim or Kelly, I mean, Jim or Kelly, I'm sorry. Can you guys hear us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. can you your... hear me? Yes. yes, please state your name and the city you live Good in. Evening. This is Kelly Spadoni, 23 year resident of Calabasas. In 2005, the voters of Calabasas approved Measure D, which prevents the city from amending the general plan to redesignate resource protected open space for non open space use without the approval of two thirds of the city's voters. In 2015, residents of Calabasas approved measure O, which removed the sunset clause in measure D to make the ordinance permanent. The initiative passed by a staggering 97.6%. <clears throat> if the developers want to pursue this development, they need to bring their proposal to grade 2.6 million cubic yards of zoned open space to a vote of the people. We already voted on this project in 2016 through measure F and the overwhelming outcome was to deny the project. We residents are tired of having the record of our choices challenged over and over again by this project. Please vote no on this project today. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Next we have Randy Fellish. Randy, please state your name and the city you live in. Good evening. This is Randy Filish. I'm a 30-year Calabasas resident and the Southern California representative and volunteer for Project Coyote. I urge you to vote against approval of the West Village project due to the negative effects it will have on our open space and our wildlife. It appears that the proposed development contradicts the city's scenic corridor development guidelines, nor does it maintain the natural topographic characters characteristics of the hillside, which um, I understand to be mandatory in the Las Virginas Gateway Master Plan and corridor design. As such, one of the biggest impacts for there is the loss of wildlife linkage and corridor. Um, neither, pro um, neither does this uh, project protect any habitat. Um, furthermore, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife emphasized the importance of the wildlife linkage and corridor for California mountain lions. Um, while we sometimes see it on see the sightings on social media, we know that mountain lions are in Calabasas. In September uh, 2020, a mountain lion was killed trying to cross the way near Parkway Calabasas. And um, also, finally, uh, the project threatens uh, species, all uh, mountain lions and other species, including deer, coyotes, bobcats, and other wildlife who have called this area home for centuries. Coexisting with wildlife is an educational process, and even in our regular suburban neighborhoods, it's always difficult, and it's always a lesson to be learned. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like when we build into this open space and we start getting all the calls about you know, conflicts with wildlife. And I think we should just take heed to that as well. So I urge you to um, vote against this project. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Next, we have um, Simon Halpern. Simon, please go ahead and st state your name and the city you live in. Sure, my name is Simon Halpern and I'm a resident of Calabasas. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Um, I am an owner and resident in the steeplechase complex that's very close to this proposed site. Uh, I'd like to state that I'm entirely against this project for all the stated dangers it represents from permanently degrading our treasured landscape to congesting our already overburdened roads. As somebody who lives in the immediate area, I can tell you that this neck of Calabasas does have a threshold for development, and I believe it's already been reached. Despite conducted surveys assuring us that the West Village could be reasonably accommodated here, I can tell you that as a local who jogs, cycles, and commutes on Las Virginis and Agora roads, forcing this project in is irresponsible as well as unsightly. 
The developer has gone to great lengths to disguise and repropose this project as appropriate and fitting. And I believe this is an absolute farce. I do respect the developer's right to build and the prospect of community enrichment. However, this proposal is a behemoth and it's obvious that a development on this scale is against the wishes of the community. This has already been proven. Finally, as I join others in asking the commission to please deny the project, I'd like to remind everyone that the letters of objection sent in represent far more bodies than their signatures. They represent couples, households, and their dependents. Please respect our wishes on behalf of this and future generations. Thank you for your time. Thank you for yours, Simon. Next, we have Olin. Olin, please state your name and the city you live in. It's yes. Melissa Olin. Can you hear me? Yes, Melissa. Oh, um, okay. My name's Melissa Olin. I live in Calabasas since 2003. Um, and I'm actually going to read some comments from Tom Haydick, the fo a former employee of the Mountain Restoration Trust. Um, his comments are as follows. I am submitting these comments to express my opposition to New Home, Com New Home Company's proposed development of West Village, located east of Los Virginis Road. I first hiked in this canyon in the mid 2010s while enjoying, employed as the restoration manager for Mount Mountains Restoration Trust. We were asked to help support this earlier development plan by collecting seed from native plants in the area for the mitigation program. I later learned that this unique wetland containing the largest colony of yerba mansa I have, had ever seen in the Santa Monica Mountains and two standing wells that also had historical value were all proposed for removal slash replacement. I told the development group that I could not support the intended destruction of these unique wetlands and thus the MRT did not offer any support for the project. About one month ago, I revisited this wetland via trail from Calabasas Dog Park to view its current state. Following a very dry winter, the Yerba Mansa wetland was saturated with spring water and had been able to withstand invasion of non-native grasses and forbs. These wetlands are most unique and worthy of preservation and enhancement and any future development project should be limited to the disturbed terrain found near Las Virginis Road on the west side of the property and not involve the destruction of hillsides or wetlands contained within the property. Um, and that's sincerely Tom Haydick. So that should dovetail with, I think the one of the previous speakers, uh, Linda, about that Yerba Mansa um, wetland area. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And cute picture of your dog. Next we have Taco. Taco, please uh, spell your, I mean, State your name and the city you live in. Hello, my name is Tamiko Fuote, and I'm a resident of Calabasas since uh, 2000. Um, at last week's me meeting, Commissioner Washburn made an announcement regarding the United Nations upcoming decade of ecosystem restoration program. And he asked us to reflect on it. He talked of showcasing the ecosystem restoration efforts we have put into our community and what we're going to do moving forward. The project site you are looking at tonight is a real live ecosystem right in our own backyard. This ecosystem has over 20 heritage oak trees. It's teeming with rare biological species like the yerba mansa and is home to a number of raptors, amphibians, and other wildlife as well. There are wetlands and ephemeral springs that provide year-round sustenance. Tonight, you will be deciding the fate of that 77-acre ecosystem. It exists now and should be, be protected now. If it isn't, it'll be gone forever, and no restoration project will ever bring it back. We're pretty good at figuring out what to do in our own community, Commissioner Washburn said. So the right thing to do in this case is to deny the project. The dedicated open space designation must be respected and the municipal codes must be obeyed. 
what better way to show the world that we don't just talk, talk, talk. We actually do what we say. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tamiko. Next, we have Maya Shulman. Maya, please state your name yes. in the city you live in. Yes, my name is Maya Shulman. I have lived in the city of Calabasas since 2001. I work also in the city of Calabasas. My children have gone through the school system at Las Virgenes Unified. Needless to say, we we'll love it. My children have written letters about the West Village development, more specifically opposing it. So here we are. I practice law and I practice law for over 20 years. And based on my profession, I guess I am jaded, but I know that whatever we say tonight will not matter in the long run. The decision has been made and it's not the decision any of my neighbors like or I like. We're going to lose out on the open space. The mountain lions will disappear. The wild space will disappear. And none of this in the end will matter. This is going to become just another urban development. The Paxton community should never have been built. The motel should never have been built. The plain community, the gated community off of Las Virginia should never have been built. And yet they exist. And yet we are talking about another vote which will be taken and I'm not sure if it's going to be counted the way that the neighbors are hoping for. It is not pretty. I urge people to find out and maybe answer honestly, if any of these developers were present in Las Virginia's Canyon during the last fire, if they had evacuated, if they've lost any people, neighbors, any property, and let them tell me if they think that this development is really in the best interest of the community and the city. I also have not heard from any developer or any financial support people whether the new commercial site is needed in the city with many cities, many centers having for lease sites. Do we need more shops off of Las Virginias? I don't think so. Do we need the hiking trail? No, we mean, my, so Maya, your time is up. Sorry, Thank your time you. is up, Maya. No. Thank you, Maya. Uh, next, we have Mark. Mark, please state your name and the city you live in. Your full name, please. Uh, my name is Mark Hestren, and unlike the mountain lions, I've only lived in Calabasas for 18 years. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for taking the time to listen to all of our comments. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate um, and maybe elaborate a little on the letter that I submitted two weeks ago. Uh, in opposition to this development. And I'm speaking more in a macro sense than any specific uh, affected constituency. Um, all of us live in Calabasas for, for specific reasons. We ended up here by choice. Um, we love the, the serenity. We love the natural beauty. We love the mountains. We love the hiking trails. We love the sense of of um, sort of removal from the city. Yeah, we're still all very accessible for our jobs and uh, for, uh, for entertainment, but we, we have a very special community and I'm not sure I fully understand as do many of my neighbors and friends, why there's a push to commercialize the area which undoubtedly will make us kind of a generic community much like Canoga Park or Woodland Hills. And I mean, no disrespect to any of those communities but what we have here is unique and we really want to preserve it. I imagine all of you uh, live in, commissioners who live in the area uh, probably feel like you want to preserve the unique characteristics uh, of, our, of, our, of our Calabasas. It's a special place. And adding more buildings, adding more hotels, adding more uh, residences, more apartment buildings doesn't bring us closer to preserving that serenity and fact that <laughs> goes just the opposite direction and 10 and five and 10 years from now I think many of us would regret uh, having allowed this extraneous development to go on I'm out of time and I appreciate yours and I hope that you will vote in opposition to this project well thank you Mark thanks for uh, uh, coming and spending some of your time next we have uh, Nolan Burkholder 
Nolan, please state your name and the city you live in. We'll come Maybe. back to Nolan, Mr. Yeah, Chair. We'll come we'll... back later. Sure, and and people should know. I think they have to press star. What was it? Star six. I think if, uh... if, if they're calling on the phone, star six. But these right. are people that I'm allowing to speak. Oh, okay. Yeah. So next we have uh, Maddie. Oops. Maddie, can you hear us? Maddie, please state Hello. your name in the city. Go ahead. Oh, hi, my name is Maddie Thompson. I have been a resident of Calabasas since 1995. I was actually born and raised in Calabasas. I have gone through the Los Angeles School District, and I am actually quite ashamed that this city has even allowed this much development. I have went away for college up north, and I came back to those orange flags. I came back to hiking paths I'm not able to hike on due to all this development, and when I was younger, I've lived off the Las Virginis. We used to have so many of the cows, the chickens, the horses, the wildlife. And now looking at the city today, we have places looking for people to rent and they don't even have renters to buy. And you guys are trying to build even more structures when we can't even fill in the latest structures. Um, on November 9th, it was my birthday. And that was the, the year that that fire came. And instead of my parents calling me, wishing me a happy birthday, they were calling me worried about how they would evacuate on my birthday I had to deal with, which is quite sad. And you guys are trying to build even more places. And how are they going to evacuate if another fire happens? Because we know that has happened. It's been happening in the city since I've been born and before then. Um, I'm gonna write a letter from one of my neighbors, um, Andrea and Bill, they live in Saratoga Hills. And here's what they have to say. Um, we have lived here for 47 years and we know you, Commissioner Washburn, we're instrumental in forming the city of Calabasas Please do, don't do about face and destroy the very city you helped create. Instead, vote to preserve our space and most importantly, to keep our citizens safe. Our Calabasas City Coast support you doing so. Reject the project and the EIR and vote to deny the same project we citizens voted six to two to deny with no on vote F in 2016. And all I have to say is that the future is watching you. The students I teach are watching you make a decision that they'll be able to play on this land and have this land in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. Okay. Uh, we're gonna allow Nolan Brookholder. Nolan, can you hear us? Uh, are you able to speak? He's Nolan? He's got to unmute himself, I think. Yeah, oh, he's, he's, unmuted he's unmuted. He's unmuted, oh, but uh, sure. I don't know. Something must be going on. Uh, let's come back to him again. Um, now we have a, a phone call uh, from uh, 918 795 Please uh, press start six. I'm going to allow you to speak and press star six, please, and state your name and the city you live in. Hi, this is Mark Citron, Calabasas resident. It seems to me that this type of meeting has turned into an adversarial hearing with the citizens as the defendant and the builder as the prosecution and the planning staff as their lawyer. Citizens are at a disadvantage in having far fewer resources at their disposal to state and substantiate their opinions. For example, there is absolutely no comment by the planning staff regarding the builder's absurd statement and in the event of a fire, residents and workers would have easy access for evacuation via the 101 freeway. One example of how lopsided the staff report appears to me. What sort of trust can we place in this report? I hope I'm correct in thinking that the planning staff works for the citizens and not for the builder. Please, I'm asking the commission to keep your ears open not only for what the planning staff says, but for what they are not saying. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. We'll try Nolan one more time, Mr. Chair. All right, go ahead. Nolan? 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead and state your name. Yeah, (laughs) state your name in the city you live in, please. Hi, my name is Nolan Burkholder, and I live in the city of Calabasas. I've been a resident for almost 20 years. Um, In 2005, the voters of Calabasas approved Measure D, which prevents the city from amending the general plan to redesignate resource protected open space for non open space use without the approval of two thirds of the city's voters. The initiative passed by a vote of 84% to 16% which was the largest vic- margin of victory at the time for anything on a Calabasas municipal ballot since incorporation. The measure included a sunset provision that would end the ordinance in, 2000- in 2030. In 2015, residents of Calabasas approved Measure O, which removed the sunset clause to make the ordinance permanent. The initiative passed by 97.6% to 2.4%. The ballot argument for Measure O was signed by James Bazagian, Mary Sue Maurer, and Dennis Washburn, among others. Measure O passed by a margin of 97.6% to 2.4%. On April 21, Measure O faces its first and most significant challenge. We find out whether it's a valid law or empty rhetoric. The current West Village project seeks to grade 2.6 million cubic yards of development restricted resource protected open space, calling that open space a public safety hazard and insisting that it has the right to invade it to facilitate construction of 180 housing units in 15 three-story buildings on another part of the property. In 2019, the Planning Commission voted to deny the project. The resolution for denial before the Planning Commission on April 21st affirms that decision, stating that, among other things, the adverse soil and geologic conditions on the development site cannot be corrected without grading the Southern Hillside area and thereby without violating these provisions of the general plan and municipal code. If the developer wants to pursue this development, it needs to bring its proposal to grade 2.6 million cubic yards of zoned open space to a vote of the people. From Measure C in 2005, Measure D in 2005, Measure O in 2015, Measure F in 2016, and Measure N in 2018, it's possible to predict the outcome of that vote. Please ask the Planning Commission to affirm its 2019 denial of the project by adopting the findings in the resolution for denial. Thank you. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, Next, we have uh, Norma Citran. Go ahead, Norma. State your name and the city you live in. Hi, I'm Norma Citron, resident of Calabasas. The ancient landslide is in a protected open space zone, OSDR, allowing the developer to use 20 acres of this open space to create building pads with fill acquired from this open space is not allowed. Open space used to prepare building pads becomes a redesignation of open space land as it's not allowed under measure O, adding insult to injury, 80 to 130 million gallons of fresh water will be used for compacting, which is equivalent to one and a half to two years water supply for Calabasas and surrounding areas. Infrastructure does not exist to use hundreds of thousands of gallons of gray or recycled water. The developer's analysis that there is probably a a 7.3 earthquake in the area, and yet they use tuck under parking. This should not be allowed. This development is built, going to be built or not, in a very high fire uh, hazard severity zone. And you've already heard that the developer says it'll be very easy for all of the uh, occupants to get to the 101 freeway as it's just 0.25 miles, but they're forgetting that there are other businesses and other residents that would like to leave as well. So I don't believe that this is a a public, uh, the public safety really is in danger there. I believe that. Uh, 18 units are being built uh, in this massive development to satisfy 5% of RENA requirement. This hardly is a compelling reason to allow this uh, project to be built on the basis of satisfying RENA numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norma. Next, we have Chelsea Mactani. Chelsea, please go ahead, state your name and the city you live in. Hi, my name is Chelsea Mogtani. Um, I live in the city of Calabasas and my family and I just relocated here from Sherman Oaks um, last fall. And we moved into the Deer Springs neighborhood. Um, we 
really primarily moved out here to leave the city, the urban jungle, the concrete jungle of Los Angeles and to find natural scenery. And frankly, I'm, I actually relocated from out of state um, almost eight years ago. And arguably we live in one of the most beautiful states in the nation. And even from the time that I've moved out here, I've just seen development all along the, all along the state. And at what point do you preserve the natural resources? And then allegedly we're, uh, which something I support is that off of, um, I think Liberty Canyon, we're gonna eventually build a wild pass, a wildlife bridge. And what's the point of building that if everybody keeps just building? What, where, where are the, where's the wildlife gonna survive? And frankly, again, my, my family, I've got a toddler, almost a two-year-old, I'm pregnant with another. And what's our legacy that we're gonna leave behind for our children? I'm tired of seeing building everywhere. And when we go on walks in the neighborhood or on the streets of Lost Hills, I see wildlife dead and run over all the time. And it's just a shame seeing that it's all about development. If you guys want to develop, just please reconstruct the buildings that already exist and leave the wildlife and all the plants and nature as is. Stop destroying all of our ecosystems. And I, I just, I strongly urge that this project does not go through. Um, it would be really be heartbreaking to see another natural area turned into a concrete building where we already, as other residents have already stated that everything is for lease. You see commercial buildings, you see residential buildings. There's so much for lease. Chelsea, your time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, next, we have uh, Raghu Lyer. Raghu, please state your name and the city you live in. Sure. Hi, uh, this is Raghu Ayer, and I live in Calabasas in the Deer Spring community. And I'm very close to this project. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for listening to this one. And uh, since I'm living so close to it, I, I do want to share kind of my experience. And then a story is, you know, we, me and my wife moved with my two kids uh, six years back to Calabasas. We both work 30 miles off this place. And the whole idea was the way we did is that we looked into a beautiful natural place close to downtown and we kept on pushing back till we came to the city and the first sight, we, we were in love, how beautiful it is and exactly where I want to see my kids growing. And that's the reason kind of six years we spent. Now during, one story I want to share, it's a real one is in, during the last wildfire, um, I took my, I was taking my kids out of the city and they closed the Lost Hills uh, 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 entry to 101 and the Malibu because of the fire and the only exit open was the last voiciness. We literally drove through a fire and smoked through it. Now, good case scenario, I'm, I cannot imagine what will happen if there are more people and more business coming there. And if a whole Calabasas has, at least this community has to even go through the same situation, they'll have no space. So I really urge the city and all, all the people to think through you know, what makes the city special. There's a reason we are here. I definitely want my kids to live through this beautiful place. Um, we really love this. We, we, I always brag this with my friends and uh, all that is, though we live in this extremely urban city in Los Angeles, we live in this small heaven called Calabasas, which is so beautiful. So I really hope we can preserve this. I totally, I'm totally against of any sort of development. It is not gonna add any value to the nature. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Uh, next, we have Jonathan Duran. Jonathan, please state your name and the city you live in. Hello, uh, names are Jonathan Duran. I'm a resident of uh, Thousand Oaks. Hello, commissioners. Uh, again, my name is Jonathan Duran. I'm a representative with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. I represent about 57,000 members in the areas that we cover here in Southern California and the adjacent states. The reason why um, I'm opposed to this project for one reason is that the developer has not committed to use local hire in the area, allowing people that live in Calabasas, Agora Hills, Oak Park, Thousand Oaks to be able to work here. The biggest concerns that we have is having the opportunity to be able to live where we, where we work and be able to build these buildings. On top of that, and we all know about the fires that do go 
or that we're very prone to in the area. Last year, or back in 2018, when the Woosley fire went through, it burned right through that area. Now let's put some condos, some apartments, people living in these areas, and what do you think will happen? More congestion and a bigger risk to the individuals that are gonna be in those areas. First responders will have harder time to go back there to be able to help people. Again, I'm opposed to this project. I want the developer to come back and with a better plan, with more clear ideas of how they can be able to utilize the space better. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, it appears that uh, we, do we do not have any more speakers. No more hands okay. up. Oh, hold on. I No, that's it. No more hands. Well, thanks so much for helping out, Mari. You're um, welcome. So now we're going to... Hold, Mr. Chair, oh. hold, um, hold on. I see a hand go up and down. So um, <laughs> I, I guess not. Okay, so we're good. So um, next, I think we're going to hear uh, something from the staff, a presentation from the staff. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. Yeah, we... Um, uh, to start, before I get into a short presentation, and again, these are uh, responses to some of the things that we heard on, uh, on last Thursday. Um, but just to remind you that we have a whole team um, ready to answer questions um, in here tonight. Um, your city staff, uh, uh, Maureen Tamori, myself, Tom Bartlett um, from Public Works. We have Robert Yalda and Tatiana Holden and our geotechnical consultant, Ross Kiobani. Um, we also have our city environmental consultants with us again, uh, Joe Power, Lindsay Sarkia, uh, Scott Shell from ATE, that, uh, the traffic consultant, and uh, Matt Hawley, our uh, geotechnical consultant uh, through um, Rincon as a sub. Um, and then we have consultants for our VMT study Sarah Brandberg um, and our assistant project manager, Annalise Miller. And uh, Thea Benson is the biologist. So we have uh, 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 a whole slew of folks that can answer questions on different disciplines. Um, we'll, we're gonna give a short just presentation here. It's really gonna be um, brief because uh, I know we need a lot of time today. Um, we are... Uh, Basically, going to start with uh, Lindsay Sarkia. Go ahead, and, before, uh, go ahead. Before we jump into the staff presentation, I want to note that we've got two further folks who raised their hands, and we didn't formally close that portion of the public hearing. So it may be wise to take those comments, those last two, then close the public comment portion of the of the evening. Subject, of course, to the commission choosing to reopen it later if there if there are questions for end members of the public. All right, let's do that. Okay, uh, Mary Weisbrock. Mary, please state your name and the city you live in. Mary. Mary Weisbrock, Agora Hills. I'm reading supplemental from the Save Open Space organization. Planning commissioners, don't be misled that the removal of this landslide is necessary. It is possible to have a development project here without removing the landslide. The truth is a development project is feasible, which can, can stay away from the landslide and not remove the scenic mountainside. It would not just mean less developable area but it would keep the development out of OSDR. Also, please planning commissioners, don't be misled by calling this a remediation of a landslide. The facts are that the bulldozers will massively remove the scenic mountainside. Then the removed earth will be moved again and then recompacted. They also are removing a large amount of dirt, 360,000 cubic yards, but are also importing 73,000 cubic yards for the removal and the repair of the landslide, removal and repair. The truck, 
traffic analysis for this is inadequate. Under city code, graded land is not considered open space. If this project grades protected OSDR, then it is no longer open space. To be consistent then, the project must go to a vote of the residents of Calabasas to destroy this beautiful deed restricted open space. Planning commissioners, please deny this proposed project. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, next, we have Brandon Alvarado. Brandon, please state your name and the city you live in. Yeah, Brandon Alvarado, Calabasas. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Brandon. <laughs> to start with, open space is irreplaceable in Calabasas. Once lost, it is gone forever. And once developed, the character of the land is forever altered. The Open Space Initiative invests in the people the power to make important decisions regarding future growth, thereby preventing a majority of the city council from permitting urban development on those parcels. Growth should be balanced with an ability to guard against unchecked development. Going back to 1991, when Calabasas was incorporated, the desire to exercise local control over land use issues was one of the primary motivating factors and still today, it ranks high among many reasons we choose to live here today as residents. <clears throat> this issue should have been stopped much like it was in 2016 when the residents voted on it, and also in 2019 when the Planning Commission voted against it. So here we are again in 2021. I feel this issue should be put to rest because the residents have already spoken on it. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. So I, again, I think we'll close this part of the public hearing where the public gets to speak and, and go back to staff. Glenn, how long will your presentation be approximately, all, the whole staff presentation? Uh, I would guesstimate about 15 minutes maximum. One five or five zero? One five. Oh, okay, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, again, and uh, you know, our, <laughs> our intent wasn't to make this drag out too too long. Um, on in Thursday's meeting, there there was a, a number of commissioners questions, and and we were able to go back and and uh, uh, address those for you tonight. And then uh, there was quite a few comments from the public, and a lot of those focused in on on code and general plan issues that were well analyzed in the 2019 staff reports and public hearings. So our intent is not to really go back right now and get into all the, all the details of, of that stuff. Our, our, our uh, um, analysis stands on that, but I've, we're gonna start tonight um, with Lindsay Sarkia from Rincon. And let me share my screen and uh, pull up a PowerPoint. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, Lin Lindsay, you're on. Great, thanks so much, Glenn um, and commissioners. My name is Lindsay Sarkia of Rincon Consultants. I'm the project manager for the West Village Project EIR. I'll be walking through some of the responses to questions and issues raised at the last hearing. Uh, my colleague, Scott Shell of Associated Transportation Engineers is also available and he'll be walking through some slides related to emergency evacuation and traffic impacts. So next slide, Glenn. So we understand, uh, oh, sorry, next slide. It's not loading for me yet. There we go, wildfire impacts. We absolutely understand that wildfire is a concern. The project site is located in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Um, the issue was discussed in section eight of the EIR initial study under hazards and hazardous materials. This is appendix A of the amended final EIR. And it was also discussed in topical response E of the response to comments on the original final EIR. So it's important to understand that CEQA is concerned with the physical impacts of the project and whether the project would exacerbate wildfire risks. And so to that end, there is no evidence that the project itself would contribute to the critical fire environment because the project site adjoins existing urban development along West Virginia's road and would not increase ignition sources in the area. The project minimizes the length of the urban wildland interface by clustering development on a smaller footprint. And the project actually creates a fuel modification buffer, which presently doesn't exist. So these are the things that were discussed in the initial study um, as we walked through wildfire impacts. 
Um, the project would be required to comply with standard fire protection requirements in the Los Angeles County Fire Code, Calabasas Municipal Code, and the California Building Code. And it would be required to comply with fuel modification requirements of the County Fire Department, including fuel modification approvals, clearance for construction, final inspection, and approval. Next slide, Glenn. Great. Emergency evacuation is another wildfire related issue that CEQA uh, requires analysis of, and it is addressed in section eight of hazardous and hazardous materials in the initial study as well, and in topical response E. So I'm gonna hand it over to Scott Shell now of Associated Transportation Engineers. Scott, if you could unmute yourself and kind of walk through the bullets on the slide in the next couple slides as well. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Shell. I'm a principal with Associated Transportation Engineers, and we work with RINCON in completing the traffic section of the final EIR. Um, with respect to emergency evacuation, as Lindsay said, it's covered in both the initial study as well as the response to comments. Uh, the analysis notes that the project site is located about a quarter mile from 101, which is the primary evacuation route for the site. Project residents and employees will be able to access the freeway from the site via Las Vegas Road. The project is also located opposite Agura Road, which is a secondary evacuation route, providing access to the recently improved Lost Hills Road US 101 interchange. Next slide, please. Uh, as Lindsay just stated, the project would be required to comply with the very high fire severity zone standard set forth in the Calabasas Municipal Code, the California Building Code, as well as the Los Angeles County Fire Code with respect to both fire safety and evacuation. Um, it's also noted that the city's adopted an emergency operations plan or EOP that includes evacuation protocol for the city. This plan has been reviewed and approved by the California Emergency Management Agency. Um, I think we heard earlier from Glenn that uh, Assistant Fire Chief Drew Smith of the Los Angeles County Fire Department is in attendance and available to respond to additional questions. Next slide. Uh, an important thing to know is that our transportation system improvements to facilitate emergency evacuation in the corridor, the project frontage improvements include the addition of a third northbound lane and sidewalks on Las Virginis Road, both north and south of the site. Mitigation measure seven, or T7B in the traffic section also requires the construction of an additional on-ramp lane at the US 101 southbound on-ramp on Las Virginis Road. These improvements would improve vehicle and pedestrian capacity and flows along Las Vegas Road corridor, and particularly at the Las Vegas Road or Road intersection. The improvements would benefit both emergency access and the functional evacuation capacity of Las Vegas Road. Next slide. Uh, on to the traffic analysis that was incorporated in the EIR. Uh, the project impacts were evaluated using the thresholds and policies that are established in the city's general plan circulation element. Uh, part of the analysis looked at traffic generation for the project, and that was based on the Institute of Transportation Engineers, or ITE, chip generation manual, the most current 10th edition. Uh, the calculations and rates are obtained through traffic studies that are conducted at hundreds of multifamily sites, and these uh, counts are then correlated to development density. There are some questions about the cumulative analysis from the public. The project traffic study included an updated cumulative analysis that considered all approved and pending projects located in the study area. Uh, the Paxton project in particular was included in the analysis. Now, there was a question about the rates and the fact that it might be an apartment versus a condominium. They, to point out the IT multifamily housing rate includes both apartments, condominiums, and townhomes. And so there really is no difference in the calculation, whether it's owner-occupied or renter-occupied. Next slide, please. The traffic study found that the project would not exceed the city's thresholds for traffic impacts. Uh, however, there was a series of mitigation measures that were recommended in the EIR to improve flows within the corridor. These include, as I stated before, widening of Las Virginis Road for a new northbound lane, north and south of the site, intersection improvements at Las Virginis Road to Gurr Road, Intersection improvements at Las Virgins Road and the US 101 southbound ramps that also include that extra lane to the freeway, as well as operational improvements at the Las Virgins Road and Monroe Road intersection. Next slide. So as, as I stated, the amended EIR, final EIR contains an updated traffic study that was completed in 2020. The study was prepared in accordance with the city standards and methodology, and it was thoroughly reviewed by city staff. Uh, 
as I said before, it incorporated the new trip generation data for multifamily units. Uh, there was a question about the effect of COVID and the traffic counts. The, uh, the traffic baseline information that's contained in the EIR was conducted uh, by counts in pre-COVID periods. And then those counts were adjusted using a 1% growth rate to represent both year 2020 and year 2025 conditions. The year 2025 represents the opening year of the project. Um, the 1% growth rate came from the LACMP and it's, it's conservative uh, in that it's a countywide average where the CMP notes that the, the background growth rate for the Calabasas community is less than 1%. So a conservative estimate of uh, developing those baseline conditions for 2020 and 2025. That concludes my portion of the presentation. I'm going to kick it back to Lindsay, and I'll be here tonight to answer questions. Thank you, Scott. Great. Thanks, Scott. Next slide, Glenn. Great. So this slide shows the project site in relation to the wildlife corridor. There were some requests for clarification of wild, wildlife corridor-related impacts. Um, this graphic is available in the final amended EIR. It shows the project site in relation to the city of Calabasas wildlife linkages and corridors layer, which is in the city's general plan. That area is shown in light orange here. As you can see, the project's development footprint, which is approximately 11 acres, makes up less than 1% of the city of Calabasas wildlife linkages and corridor area, which is approximately um, 1,679 acres. In a post-project condition, the corridor at the location of the project site would be approximately uh, three quarters of a mile at the project site location. Next slide, Glenn. Great. Um, impacts to wildlife corridor is addressed and mitigated in the amended final EIR in section 4.3. Um, the topic is also addressed in topical response B of the original final EIR. Um, the project would reduce the width of the corridor by 25% um, at that location. Despite the encroachment into that wildlife linkage and corridor area, the open space surrounding the site, the EIR found, would continue to provide passage for wildlife movement. So this, in part, is on some analysis that's in the original final EIR, in which we state and find that the Center of Biological Diversity recommends a minimum width of 1,000 feet for wildlife corridors, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife recommends a minimum width of 0 0.6 to 1.2 miles. So at this location of the worst case impact to the wildlife corridor from the project site's development footprint, the proposed final wildlife corridor in the vicinity of the project site of, of three quarter miles exceeds the minimum width recommended by the Center of Biological Diversity and falls within the minimum width recommended by CDFW. So for these reasons, um, impacts to the wildlife corridor were found to be less than significant in the AR with mitigation. The mitigation that is required um, is mitigation measure BIO5 which requires wildlife friendly fencing to allow for movement. And the project would also be required to comply with Cal, uh, Calabasas Municipal Code's requirements for light spillover. Um, it's also important to note, as you can see on this last point in the slide, that the analysis of potential impacts to wildlife corridors in the general plan EIR focused almost exclusively on the same location as the project site. And that analysis determined that impacts to wildlife corridors would be less than significant. Next slide, Glenn. Hey, Lindsay, real quick, I want to go back sure. one slide. Let me see if I can get us there. And my technology is not working. Here we go. So I just want to um, point out here that um, in this box in the right hand corner, we wanted to demonstrate here about really the size of this development footprint in relation to the entire size of the wildlife corridor. And that that quarter mile, uh, that three quarter mile, um, which will continue to be the corridor, um, which the quarter mile impingement is, really is only a port, a point on the development footprint. And uh, you, as you can see here, there's quite a bit of area around in the open space, including where the landslide is, that will be restored, that will continue to function as that open space. So I just wanted to point out kind of that perspective on the size of the corridor versus what we're really uh, talking about in terms of development here. Thanks, Glenn. Okay, Thanks. right, we're on to, to the surveys. Right, there were some questions regarding the biological resources surveys raised at the last hearing. So we wanted to provide a summary of kind of the comprehensive surveys that have been done so far. 
Um, there have been 15 biological resources surveys completed at the project site between 2010 and 2020. Um, multiple habitat assessments, rare plant surveys, um, protocol surveys for California gnatcatcher and least bells vireo and bat survey. Surveys included habitat assessments for all special status species, which included California red-legged frog, mountain lion, and American badger. No individuals of special status species were observed during the surveys. Nonetheless, mitigation has been identified in the EIR for species with potential to occur within the project site. Um, in sum, too, the project site consists of about 45% non-native vegetation communities or disturbed areas and 55% native vegetation communities. I think the next one is my last slide here. Impacts to wetlands. So there were some uh, questions related to wetland impacts. Um, Impacts to wetlands are addressed and mitigated in the amended final EIR in section 4.3 as well under impact bio 4. An assertion was made that impacts to wetlands aren't allowed under the law and that is incorrect development on and adjacent to wetlands is allowed under the law, but in order to do that projects must obtain appropriate regulatory permits to impact wetlands. Um, and project impacts and mitigation requirements would be authorized by applicable federal and state agencies. These include the Army Corps of Engineers, Regional Water Quality Control Board, and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. These permits are evaluated and issued by respective agencies prior to the grading, grading stage, any disturbance of a project, but not prior to project entitlement. Next slide, Glenn. Great, I think I'm handing it over to Matt Summers now. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm going to cover a couple of key points. Before I get into the point on the slide here, uh, I think I'm going to actually take an opportunity to note another point that was raised by some of the commenters tonight, which, and this is a bit of a surprise to staff, but you'll understand the point. Measure F, the Canyon Oaks 2016 ballot measure. Measure F was a measure put on the ballot by referendum after the city council voted three to two to approve the prior Canyon Oaks project. The ballot question asked the voters whether or not ordinance number 2016-333, which approved changing the existing zoning from the prior planned development residential multifamily to uh, development to commercial retail to accommodate the hotel and related portions of that prior project should or should not be approved. And of course, as we all know, the voters rejected measure F resoundingly. I, I bring it up to note that that rejection did not reject all development on this project from a legal perspective. I'll leave the politics to the politicians. From a legal perspective, the adopted no vote on measure F meant that the city rejected ordinance number 2016-333. And I'll quote here from the impartial analysis that was in the ballot book. A no vote on measure F would reject ordinance 2016-333 and mean that the development project described above 67 single family homes, four affordable units within two duplex structures, and the 72,872 square foot hotel could not be implemented. The city will be prevented from approving the same or substantially similar development for a period of one year. A no vote does not change the previous zoning and general plan designations for the project site. See background, and these would remain in effect. <clears throat> period, end quote. I cite that to note, just to clarify for the members of the public, who may, who may not have their ballot book handy, that the 2016 vote uh, by the city's voters to reject Measure F rejected the zone change that was on the table at the time, rejected the hotel, and rejected the Kenyon Oaks project. It did not consider the legal status of other projects, and it did not reject the West Village project, as this project had not been, had not and has not yet been approved by the city, and therefore not even yet reached the referendum stage. So I just wanted to clarify that point, as I know uh, we received some questions on that one. So on to the slide point, reasonable range of alternatives. CEQA requires that the city in every EIR consider a reasonable range of alternatives. It doesn't, and the quotes on the slide, it need not consider every conceivable alternative. Rather, it's to be a reasonable range of alternatives that allow this, the public and the decision makers to understand the project and the impacts that will stem or may stem from the project and to foster informed decision-making. As a result of this, the city has considered the original four alternatives. And as we've seen in the revised amended final EIR, reconsidered both alternative four, which has now been recommended for rejection and added the new alternative five. In doing so, the city has prepared a defensible EIR with a reasonable range of alternatives because the alternatives analyze more 
several ways to accomplish the project's objectives and do so while assessing the impacts of each of the different proposed alternatives as compared to each of the 18 require, um, potential areas of environmental impact required to be analyzed under CEQA. The key point to remember is that the reasonable range of alternatives that is required to be prepared under CEQA need not examine off-site alternatives for a, for a relatively small, in the grand scale, development project the city is, is allowed to, and has done so, to consider only alternatives that are on site because the project objectives is laid out by the general plan, call for house, some housing development on the site. So the city analyzed several ways to get there. The, the same is true in that the alternatives range considered the other constraints on site. It need not have gone off site. Next slide, please. Thank you. As part of that, in assessing the range of alternatives that's been prepared, the city is not required by CEQA to approve only the environmentally superior alternative. Instead, the city is required to identify and disclose that alternative. And the EIR has done so. The EIR, EIR notes that the environmentally superior alternative overall is the no project alternative. That is to build nothing on site. As is perhaps obvious, because building nothing will certainly have no impacts. The next most environmentally severe alternative, which is also required to be separately identified, if the is alternative five, which is identified as the among the building options, the most environmentally superior because it has the least impacts. The question has been raised: is the alternatives analysis invalid because it does not identify an alternative that lacks a, any significant unmitigated environmental impact? And that is not correct. The city in analyzing its regional range of alternatives, as noted before, must cabin that based on the project objectives. It is certainly the case that, it, that at times, every project on a site is going to have at least one significant environmental impact that's unmitigatable, as is true here. And in so doing, the city's obligation is to identify and disclose to the public and the decision makers all of the environmental impacts that would stem from the project and from each of those alternatives and then to identify within the project or the alternatives, which is the most environmentally superior. But the CEQA is a disclosure statute. The obligation is not to approve that which is environmentally superior. Rather, it is to identify what is environmentally superior and then only to approve that which the uh, decision makers here, the planning commission recommending to the city council who will decide, find is the project that meets the, the relevant findings, meets the relevant standards, and if the project or alternative that is approved has a significant unmitigated environmental impact, then do also approve a statement of overriding considerations, finding that there are overriding economic, social, or other benefits that justify approving the project in spite of whichever identified significant environmental impact may exist. And in the proposed uh, approval reso exhibit A, said findings are made. Next slide. Thank you. A little bit on housing laws and RENA. Uh, we've heard a number of, of questions about housing laws, and we've certainly seen a significant discussion of housing laws in the commentary, most notably from the State Department of Housing and Community Development. As a plain statement of law, the Housing Accountability Act and the No Net Loss Law do not compel the city to approve this project, nor to approve Alternative 5. Instead, they raise the bar for the city to do so. They raise the bar for the, for the city to defend such an approval in court, and they raise the bar in terms of required findings. The required findings are for a denial are contained in the housing, the um, exhibit B, which is the, the draft denial resolution, making the separate findings as recommended by staff for the Housing Accountability Act issue and the no net loss law issue. The Housing Accountability Act requires that if the city is to deny a housing development project as defined, it must, that is consistent with the city's general plan and zoning standards on an objective basis, that it may still deny the project or condition it at a reduced density if the city finds that there is an objective health or safety standard or impact that cannot be mitigated that will be caused by the project. And the findings that the recommended draft, draft finding to that effect are in exhibit B. The second requirement under the no net loss law is that if the city is to deny a project or approve at a lower density, a project that will, uh, on, a, on the site or a site that is identified and relied upon 
in the city's existing housing element for part of its arena requirements. That is the regional housing needs allocation requirements to zone for a certain amount of housing to fulfill the city's affordable housing obligations. To deny a project that's cited in the arena and cites, cites availability analysis requires a certain set of additional findings, namely that either the city has met its arena obligation for all housing categories, which this city has not, or that there is alternative sufficient alternative sites to still comply with the city's arena obligations at each affordability level without this site. And the exhibit B contains that set of findings as well uh, as it is staff's assessment that there are sufficient alternative sites to meet the city's arena without the West Village site. However, that raises a further point to consider as to a denial. Namely, if the city is to, were to deny the project or to deny alternative five and the project, then it will the this commission on recommendation in the city council at decision will face a choice whether to list the project site in the sixth cycle that is the next housing element or not if it is listed again we expect that the state will force the city to allow it to be approved by right at at least 20 units per acre minimum plus any additional units that may stem from a density bonus which would mean that the project that future project could not be denied um, it provided it met the ministerial standards as to units and height and setbacks. Or second, as may be the preferred alternative, given the realities that we will we may be seeing, uh, were the city to deny this project, to simply not include the West Village site at all in the six cycle housing element. Doing so would prevent the site from being developed uh, under the, not, not period, but prevent it from being developed under a by right obligation under the housing element. However, the housing capacity would have to be replaced somewhere else, which would mean something else would have to be upzoned to accommodate those additional units. And the choice of what else should be upzoned is not on tonight's table, but would be on the table in the future. There are options, of course, the options would include some of the other vacant undeveloped land, or if that may also be too high a price, then further upzoning of the existing commercial areas and existing underutilized um, parking lots and other commercial areas along the 101 freeway. Those areas would need to be upzoned perhaps significantly in order to create a sufficient housing capacity to meet the six cycle arena requirements while leaving the West Village site off the table. So some points to think about as the commission considers its options this evening. And I think, do I have the next slide? No, that was my last slide. I think I now turn it to- Matt, if I Tom. could, on that, on that, point oh, that ahead. last bullet there I'd like to point out that even in the instance that if the city were to uh, based on a denial of the project first of all and secondly uh, hypothetically based on a decision to not include the same property as part of the six cycle housing element inventory that would not change the zoning on the property and the zoning for the 180 units and the general plan designations would still be there so I wanted to point that out. That is correct. Uh, unless the city were to take other action, that's correct. Thank you, Matt and Tom. Um, I'll finish this out for now. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there was a, quite a few comments that discussed uh, the general plan and, and the development code. And, and um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, our finding is that the proposed project is consistent with 140 general plan policies and completely compliant with the standards in the development code. Um, that all was analyzed in your previous reports and presentations um, and back in 2019. And in particular, um, what I wanna kind of uh, pull up uh, just a few, a few tidbits here um, to highlight a few items. Um, that this project is consistent with those standards related to grading and landslide repair in open space areas, resource conservation, and hillside development. So I'll start with highlighting open space a little bit. Um, our general plan, contrary to what we've heard, does allow, does not prohibit, I should say, landslide repair, grading, infrastructure, and utilities in open space areas. And I'm gonna refer particularly to 
policies 3-2, 3-5, and 3-7. And I've included the language uh, verbatim out of the general plan. Um, and as you can see, uh, we've underlined the areas that are clear that um, in policy 3-2, for example, um, that we need to limit the permitted density of development within lands designated as open space, not just outside, but within. Um, again, policy 3-5 um, limits landform modification within areas designated as open space. And then finally, 3-7 requires development within and adjacent to open space areas be screened with native landscaping. So our general plan does not prohibit that activity. Um, as we mentioned in the staff reports and worthy of repeating, approximately 61 acres of this project is currently designated and zoned as OSDR. Um, and if this project is approved, we'll increase that total by five acres to 66 acres. Um, now OSDR does prohibit the establishment of permanent human occupancy type land uses in that designation, but again, does not prohibit all forms of development um, some of those examples are trails, pathways, emergency accesses, gradings of slopes to stabilize utilities, drainage systems, and other infrastructure um, that is not only currently located in it, is upgraded from time to time. Um, and since uh, uh, Measure O was, was mentioned quite a few times, um, as it relates to this project, Measure O, which is Section 1716030 in our code applies only when lands that are currently designated OSR or OSRP are proposed to be changed to new uses through an amendment to the general plan. If that were to occur, then it's correct that it would require a two thirds vote of the city voters. Um, an example of that, if we were gonna change the OSRP designation on this site to business retail, then that would require uh, to go to an election. Measure O does not apply in this case because the proposed project is not redesignating any portion of the property from OSRP to any other land use category. It's simply repairing a landslide feature in it. Um, lastly, just want to note a little bit about hillsides and safety. Um, we have some relevant policies in the general plan that relate to open space elements. Um, and these are more in regard to hillside standards, um, but policy 312, 313, 316, and 318 uh, basically require hillside development to minimize landform alteration, use contour grading techniques, avoid mass graded mega pads, and prohibit development on slopes of 50% or more unless required for trails or for safety purposes. Um, you know, co combine that with our safety element policy, which states that uh, we need to incorporate adequate mitigation measures into proposed development projects to achieve an accept acceptable level of risk from potential seismic hazards resulting in ground motion or fault rupture. So, I mean, in this case, we have a landslide and we're told by all the experts that it needs to be mitigated. Um, the plan as we have it right now proposes to contour grade consistent with hillside policies. Um, that grading is in open space areas, but required for safety for this project site. So our finding is that the project is consistent with relevant hillside development standards. Um, that ends our presentation for uh, items that were brought up. Um, I will note that during the course of, of not only the first night, but we heard a little bit more tonight about the Yerba Mansa wetland feature. Um, we didn't have it in our presentation, but we have Thea Benson from Rincon, uh, which who, who's, she's been the, our project biologist uh, for this site, available for questions should the commissioners want to ask some more questions about Yerba Mansa. 
And uh, a reminder that we have Assistant Fire Chief Drew Smith available for questions about wildfire safety. Thank you. And I'll Thank stop you, sharing my uh, screen now. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I'm getting a little concerned about time because that took over half an hour and uh, we still have to hear from the applicant and then the commission commissioners will probably want to ask questions and then we have to deliberate as I said so I guess now from the applicant is there anything uh, what, what would like what would the applicant like to present uh, Mr. Blaine or I don't know if you're here yeah you're here I don't know who's leading it but um, Mr. I'd Schadefeld. Be, okay. I'm happy and I'm going to be brief, so worry okay. not. Um, I, I just wanted to say, to, to cap this off, um, there's been so much information. The record is pretty thorough, and there, the information's all there. We would request a vote tonight, please, on this. Um, and I think there's been enough, uh, enough information that's been presented to make an informed decision. I would say too that in some way when you got a project like this it's all you know the city has already in some in some way already approved this it's in your general plan it's in your general plan for 180 units 155,000 square feet of commercial on 16 acres what you see is a reduced version of that going from 16 to 11 approximately 11 which uh, clearly means you were adding more to the open space quota but also the a dramatic you know, uh, reduction in the commercial square footage. So it's already been looked at in the EIR. It's already been really approved in concept by this city. Um, and you know, as the courts have said, that general plan is the constitution for all future land use uh, and subsidiary enactments, including all the zoning uh, code, ordinances, et cetera, everything has to be vertically consistent with that general plan. So when you do see that little triangle of development next to an open space designation, and that triangle uh, has to be developed at a 1.5 factor of safety under the uh, city's own zoning code, section 17.20.130A6 to be specific, it's clear what the intent is for that, for that, uh, that open space, that OSDR. And the part, is, part of that is to achieve that factor of safety for the adjacent uh, buildable area. And that's all there. It's all presented in, in a vertical harmony in your general plan and vertical harmony with your zoning code. And uh, so I just wanted to say that again, um, just for your consideration. And with that, only to say that we're here if you have further questions from the applicant. We've got the whole team that Matt Blaine uh, presented and introduced last time. So thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Schoenfeld. Okay, so uh, Matt, should I now just close the public hearing and? Uh... Yes, that would be in order. All right, comparison. so then the public hearing is closed and now uh, we're gonna hear from the commissioners first asking questions and uh, it's not like we're sitting up on the dais and I can go in, in row on the dais. Um, uh, Maureen, you had a question? Yes. Um... Um, Chair Harrison and Commissioners, I know that um, we have limited time with Chief Drew Smith. My recommendation is to address questions of uh, fire safety to him um, so that we can excuse him. Oh, to okay. Back so, out into the field. All right. So I was just going to say the order because I'm just going to follow the uh, Brady Bunch grid I've been given here. And, and the first person would be uh, Bob Leah, and then John, and then Dennis, and then Daniel. And I'll just follow that order. And so I guess uh, uh, that's a good recommendation. Do you, uh, do you have any questions first for just uh, Chief uh, Smith, uh, Bob? Uh, you have to unmute, I think. Bob? I'm good on time if you want to continue your meeting. I'm here. For okay. Okay. But let, let's, well, that's all right. Let's just focus on it. Bob, do you have any questions just for Mr. Smith, uh, Chief Smith? Uh, it's just a general question, Chief. Do you, are you resident here? Not in, in Calabasas? Calabasas? No, sir. I am in Thousand Oaks. Okay. Uh, were you around during the Woolsey fire? I was actually 
portion of that area, I was a branch director. So I was one of the operations section chiefs, and I was one of the branch directors uh, combating the fire from the time that it started until the day it ended. So then you are, I guess, painfully aware how the roads were closed and people could not get from one place to another. Uh, yes, that is, um, it, that is uh, done and unified with law enforcement for determining evacuation routes, for determining egress for fire apparatus, and also based upon the infrastructure damage that was done from Westlake Boulevard extending to the coast, Decker Canyon, also from Malibu Canyon to the coast. Yeah, I understand why it was done. I'm just saying you understand that it was done and people were trapped and could not move from one place to another. Because yes, of the that Okay, that's that's the point I wanted to uh, raise. Thank you, Chief. And Commissioner Muller. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, Chief. Uh, just to uh, follow up on Commissioner Leah. So, if I understand what you said, uh, well, let me ask this: Did the this was county fire and local law enforcement that uh, was present during the Woolsey fire? Yes, yeah, so for the Wolsey Fire, we're in a unified command. So you had Los Angeles County Fire, Los Angeles City Fire, Ventura County Fire, and our law agencies that were in unified command. So the direction of law will come into what the needs are for the operations section to navigate the roads, public safety as being number one. And, and I assume that you would uh, agree that all of the agencies that you just identified used their best professional judgment during those uh, evacuation procedures? Yes. <clears throat> and notwithstanding uh, that best professional judgment, uh, there still were some issues, as Commissioner Leah pointed out, about inability of people to egress the area, correct? That is correct. And as a result of those issues and problems, uh, have you all gone back and said, scratch your head and said, is there something that we could improve that would not result in these uh, log jams, um, notwithstanding our best efforts? Yeah, so that is a continuing, so that wasn't new to us, the Woolsey fire, but remember that on the Woolsey fire, an evacuation order that was put in place and implemented, we evacuated over 250,000 residents. And nowhere else in American fire history has that been done under advancing wildfire from the time that we implemented it. So yes, with what we do is best practice. And one thing in fire and law is we get lessons learned after we have an event, regardless of the, of the magnitude, we look at best practice and how to be more efficient on evacuations. And with that, there's three different methods. There's the evacuation order, there's an evacuation warning, or there's a shelter in place. And so that is um, standard terminology of what best practice is. And it's all based upon fire magnitude, rate of spread, and time on what is gonna be in the best interest of public safety. With a unified effort with law enforcement to coordinate um, uh, egress for first responders, your fire equipment and law enforcement, and to make a determination on evacuation routes and people taking order and direction on that. Um. Would you agree that regrettably we could have another Woolsey fire in this area? Well, yes, but not anytime soon. And the reason is, is because of the fuel loading. So can you have the same rate of spread? The answer is yes. Can you still have the same energy release out of the fuel bed? The answer is no. And so can you have a large fire, yes, but with different fire effects, that's because the fuel loading fires burn differently in something that burned in 2018 to 2021 compared to the last time that fuel bed burn was in the 2005 and then portion 2007 and then the 96 Calabasas fire. 
So when you have a fuel bed that has mature vegetation, and we know that our um, fire environment is more receptive based upon climatology and fuel conditions during the late summer and fall months, you have significant challenge under a uh, red flag on high fire hazard days. And, and um, absent another fire in the near future, when would you anticipate the fuel load to uh, get back to about what it was during Woolsey? How many years? 20. So on climatology and our evergreen um, and our um, climatology that we have and the fuel type, on average to get the fuels in a state to produce the same effects, you have a live fuel component of things that are lush and green, but then through that cycle of that plant getting more mature, that usually happens after it's 20 years old because it accumulates a lot of dead material. It um, develops a lot of dead organic material across the wildlands, which contribute to the enhancement of uh, more significant energy release, making it more challenging for fire suppression activities, whether they're land-based or air-based, meaning your fire engines, your bulldozers, your hand crews, compared to your helicopters or fixed-wing aircraft. Yeah, thank you. And just one last question, Chief, if I may. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that, that uh, were this project in place during the Woolsey Fire, the fact that there would be 180 plus residents, that's 180 units, there's gonna be more than one per unit, would put an additional strain on the uh, congestion in the, in the areas with which you've already testified there was congestion. Correct. So anytime that you have a higher density in population, it becomes more challenging. So time of day of the fire, is a significant impact on the population. So a fire that happens at two in the morning may be different than at two in the afternoon. But there's a however. With um, building construction standards through the process, the, the building type and how the buildings are constructed now through the approval process have different fire standards but to answer your question on population, anytime you have more people in an area, there's more challenges. However, if there's different options in a home that was built, let's just say in the 40s or 50s in a very wooded area, those challenges are different compared to new construction with um, significant road systems um, and terrain that are more navigatable than those that are way deep in some of the canyons and narrow roads. But I don't want to be one-sided on it because there's quite a few variables, sir, on, on how we set with people, how they evacuate and where they're at and best practice and how to move them. But overall, anytime you have more of a population area, you have more moving parts and you have a different set of complexities based upon population. Well, I really uh, uh, appreciate your candor and your service. My father was a LA city fireman for 30 plus years and uh, fought a lot of brush fires in, in this area. So yeah, it's, um, it's a great organization. We work with them well and I'm on year 33. Good for you, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Dennis, do you have any questions for Chief Smith? Um, Dennis, if you could unmute yourself, I can't. I can't hear. Oh. How's that? Okay. Um, this project is actually um, in its long-term um, evolution is al allowing us to. Uh, think differently about the way we deal with protecting ourselves from the various slings and arrows that the world throws at us whenever we decide to live in a particular place like this. Um, when it comes to fire, and thank you for being with, uh, with us this evening, uh, Chief Smith, um, I, I think that the way the resolutions are written 
um, if there is approval of the project, most of the infrastructure that's necessary to protect this property is already well considered from what I could read. Um, and we've done our own research here at Calabasas. And if you ask our planning department, they'll tell you that um, our experience is that any of the um, construction that's happened in our community after the building codes in California were um, substantially upgraded, um, most of those structures you know, did not fail during the Woolsey fire or the old fire or the hill fire that were within a four or five year period of time that we all suffered. But there is a lot of potential uh, for using what we have learned in this arena um, and on this project since uh, while we're at it, you know, even though it, <laughs> those are oftentimes the most expensive, you know, words in the English language, while we're at it, I did that when I had to remodel my house and you ought to see the bill. <laughs> but it gives you a chance to look forward to um, how we want to live, not just how we uh, have to live because of the constraints that we put on ourselves. So among the things I would like to know is that um, anything that we discover that can improve our circumstances when it comes to fire and water and energy and um, you know, land conservation, um, that you know, our agencies like LA County Fire and you know, the uh, other fire agencies and emergency services providers, it would be a good opportunity for us to look at um, technology. Center technology is something that would be absolutely critical in my opinion. And I, my experience where in, if we can find the fire before it gets away from us in Chatsworth and comes down to Malibu and wipes us out, that would be good and it would be economical to deal with center technology. Um, I've, I've seen presentations um, of drone technology and um, helicopter patrols that um, are changing the way we um, sense and then deal with and respond to fire and you know deal with suppression. There's also um, you know gel technology that makes water go farther, longer and stick to vertical surfaces and is bio uh, remediable. Uh, you can wash it away and it, um, it, it actually helps us out. But at this point, um, you know, we're still using FOSCheck, the pink stuff, and that's a biohazard. It works, you know, to disrupt the, you know, the uh, low blowing flames. But, you know, when you have a 50 mile an hour wind or 80 mile an hour wind going by, we got some major problems. So, What's the possibility of us adding during this time of planning um, the technology where we deal with the engine types instead of, I mean, you don't need a hook and ladder, you know, to put a fire out in my house, you know, and um, we scramble engines to, you know, our houses whenever we have a heart attack or things like that. And thank God you're there. We appreciate that. But, you know, there are other vehicle types that, can respond to the kinds of needs and interests that we have. So um, I don't know if that kind of thinking has been applied in this instance. And Glenn, uh, you might be able to help me by saying that uh, we did in fact consider these various kinds of things, or we are using this opportunity to upgrade the city of Calabasas and the services that we require so that we're not just dealing with defensible space, but we're dealing with all the better things in technological approach whether it's you know drone technology to sense stuff or fixed base stuff, there are drone sensors you put on top of Saddle Peak, or you know on top of Calabasas Peak, or create a range of things like that, so that when you see a fire happening, you can you know vector you know the the equipment that's appropriate to stop it before it turns into the monster that Woolsey was. One of the other things that um, concerns me is that while it isn't your problem, Chief Smith, um, you are, you know, I think a good part of the solution and you might be able to advise us on how to deal with the experience that we did gain about the communications failures because of the power shutoffs and also the destruction of, you know, the above ground utilities and wooden poles. And I know Edison and others are doing all the things they need to do, but, you know, uh, you know fire cut service. So, um, it would be valuable to us to know that we are um, 
doing everything we can and that you're doing everything you can to help us deal with policies for 2050 instead of, you know, dealing with what happened to us in, you know, you know, 2020. So I would say uh, power shutoffs, cell service disruptions, um, you know, dealing with uh, our own uh, penchant for uh, preserving land. I mean, it's really interesting to me, you know, we saved almonds and ranch, but, you know, in essence, we, uh, we, we created the bomb that, you know, the fuse from Chatsworth lit and it went all the way to the coast. And I know that uh, there's enough energy in an acre of chaparral that if it went up in the same instant that an H-bomb or an A-bomb went off, there's enough a energy in an acre to be a Hiroshima bomb. So early detection and then uh, you know, preparing in advance to deal with the kind of uh, effort. And you know, obviously you heard us talking tonight about the uh, wildlife corridor. I mean, that's an oak savanna that our city actually obtained from the developers that were building out the oaks and other projects in the community. And now it's in the hands of MRCA and the Santa Monica Mounts Conservancy. They have a fire station that's down um, Los Verdes, <coughs> Malibu Canyon Road. I don't think they have any more advanced technology than we, than we have now. And I would say that we should be working to make that happen for the whole community, not just for this project, if it goes forward or not. Those are comments. Uh, you might be able to help me by telling me that, you know, LA County Fire is in fact dealing with everything from drones to gels to um, communications, uh, technology and saving grace in that all, in all those instances. I'll shut up and let you, let you answer my questions. Good points and those are great questions. So uh, your Los Angeles County Fire Department is and offers the most robust initial attack firefighting workforce in the world. With our aircraft fleet from our engine companies to what we have our bulldozers and our hand crews, plus the unified approach we have with our partners. You have the most robust initial attack response anywhere in the world. On technology, uh, lucky for you and lucky for me and for the Los Angeles County Fire Department that I'm on the National Fire Behavior Steering Committee. So I work in this fire science, fire behavior yep. analyst, fire ecology, fire world every day. So what your fire department is doing with you, we are partnered with, and all the agencies are partnered with NOAA, the National Weather Service Los Angeles. They have a satellite called the GOES satellite that detects uh, heat energy from a satellite. So we get instant notifications upon a fire start. Um, in the absence of it not being reported, but usually they go hand in hand. Also, we have and are working with um, groups, which we already have in place, which is, is uh, heat sensing technology via camera systems that are set up called alert wildfire that also detect heat energy and heat sources. But I can tell you that very rarely, very rarely on the initial phase of a fire, does it go unreported, undetected within the first 10 minutes? I can tell you that over a hundred years worth of fire history and 800, close to 800,000 acres in the Santa Monica mountains within the last hundred years, that the under adverse Santa Ana wind driven fire conditions, which is our fire regime here. Right. It is, it is, uh, man-made somehow, mechanical uh, failure, um, malicious intent, um, a traffic accident, a near accident. We don't live in a nature-dependent fire regime. It, it takes a human element of some sort. And with that being said, when we have our high-risk days, we categorize those high risk days because of your fire department that we do fuel sampling within our five forecast zones within Los Angeles County. 
within the city of Calabasas, you lie within the Los Angeles forecast zone and the Santa Monica Mountains forecast zone. We have automated remote weather stations that collect data every day, 365 days a year. And we categorize that data to look at what our weather conditions are, then we match it with our fuel conditions because we know when those crosshairs come together, we know what supports the right recipe to large fires. So you mentioned the old fire. That was a Mayish or Juneish type of fire several years ago in off of Mulholland in, in, in um, Calabasas. That's where I live. <laughs> that was a, under a southwesterly wind, a routine warm day and an independent of or not dependent upon a Santa Ana wind event. But it was in a fuel bed that was over 50 years old. Some of the fire history showed that didn't, the last time that burnt, some of the areas was in 1927. So you have the energy release that came out of that that produced a 900 acre fire that went to basically the top of Summit to Summit Motorway. However, so what does your fire department do? We look at a relative risk um, during our prime summer uh, months for fire. Because we know routinely, as you can say, from June 1st to Christmas is when we start supporting the ability to have initial attack fires. If we have an off prime fire season fire, it's 100% wind dependent and you need the wind to move it if it's outside of, if it's within January, February, March, April, or May. Fire history for a hundred years shows that. And we look at the climatology so we know what our relative risk is. We issue the alerts, we issue the warnings, we get the media out there. So we are actively engaged in this. You talked about gels. You talked about the Fozcheck, the Monsanto products. The gels are fabulous fabulous because they're also a third party test and you can use them in different areas. The, the, excuse me, excuse me for interrupting Chief Smith. We need to move on to other people and ask other questions, but we get your, I appreciate your response that you're talking about all the different technology, but we're here on a you know specific project. And you so, can. and I'm grateful that the fire department is, is a leader in all that area. So let's move on to uh, commissioner Milstein. Hi Chief Smith. How you doing? Thank you. I uh, just had two questions. Um, what's your assessment on how you'll be able to handle evacuation of the new development when the next fire comes into the area, given the resources? And do you feel there could be a situation where residents could be boxed in? Um, the other question is, uh, can and will fire mandate that the whole development be sprinklered? So as far as the building requirements per the fire code, that is not within my scope of practice to know the fire code and being that close to it. So I know that our fire prevention office adheres to whatever the planning process is, that it'll be up to the current standard. I can't answer on the fire prevention portion of what code requirements will be in place. I can talk to you though, with the it being built, if constructed, it'll be to the current standards because it has to go through the inspection process during the planning phase and development phase. To answer your question on evacuations, there is a transition with larger streets, more water supply and new building standards that a shelter in place order may be the right component for a lot of our communities because it does cause congestion to evacuate when, why would you put yourself in a position of vulnerability to leave a safer area and put yourself in a vulnerable position out in the road system where you have to navigate traffic, possibly embers or being stuck somewhere to where the shelter in place order could be in effect for certain residencies um, in, in the event of a wildfire. Um, if I may, on the fire sprinkler question, they would have to be fire sprinkler under the code. That's our understanding. All the, all the buildings? Correct. Okay. 
commercial, the commercial building as well as the multifamily. Okay. Is that the inside or also the outside? And what about the grounds? Well, the, the grounds would already have sprinkler systems via landscaping. They'd also already have um, and be required to carry out regularly their uh, fuel modification. And then um, the fire sprinklers would be required for the buildings. That's an inside thing. There'd be fire resistance um, componentry in terms of the building materials, the windows, everything. Can we on require the exterior, sprinklers on the roofs? I don't know the code. Maureen can answer that. Um, the, the homes that were just done in Calabasas, the Wolseley Fire Rebuilds, do have a sprinkler component as well. It depends on what the fire department requirement will be. So the fire department gets 100% authority over what their requirements would be. Uh, it's nothing that the city needs to act on. We act on their expertise. Um, but, but hardening a building, and I will ask uh, Chief Smith to maybe address this. Uh, if you look at uh, satellite images of the Wolseley Fire, especially up in the Malibu areas, you'll notice that the newly built homes did well in that fire. They did not burn to the ground. So I'll ask uh, Chief Smith to comment on how fire hardening can protect the building. That's a, great, that's a great question and a good comment. Yes, the home hardening is becoming the standard of what we want because we know that we're going into where you have a reduction in fuels from the house out based upon a pure landscaping design and then sometimes the homeowners and the tenants are their own worst enemy sometimes with clutter outside the homes that can contribute to um, potential structure loss. But the new building requirements in the wildlands significantly, significantly reduce um, the structure loss component based upon the uh, home hardening standards, if you will, in the fire code. All right. I don't have any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Smith, for appearing. Um, you're welcome to stay, but we're going to move on to questions of other uh, by the uh, by the commissioners of other uh, people. So back to you, Commissioner Leah. Any other questions of staff or applicant or anybody? Yes, I have about uh, ten questions on the uh, geology. Go ahead. Uh, okay. In the, them following through the uh, EIR. Uh, there's a statement in here. These, are not, these analyses determine it is probable that the project will experience at least one moderate to severe ground shaking event from one of the nearby faults, which could be up to 7.3 in magnitude. What's the frequency? Next year? Next week? Next century? Hi, Commissioner Leah. I think uh, we have uh, actually two consultants. We have Matthew Hawley from LGC Valley um, for uh, a sub through Rincon, or we have uh, um, oh uh, Andy Price from Layton. Either of those can uh, probably answer that better. I guess the guy with the crystal ball. About, uh, how about Matthew Hawley? Are you there? I think Andy Price would need to raise his hand because, um, or I'm sorry, he's a panelist. A yes, I'm here. Sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. <laughs> this is Matt Hawley. Um, the question you're referring to is called the design basis earthquake. Um, and it's a probability analysis looking at um, earthquake faults in the local area and the probability of an earthquake every year occurring on any one of those faults and affecting the site. Um, I believe that analysis was done in every single one of the reports um, that I reviewed. Um, it would need to be up to the current UBC, uh, which I'm sure would be done uh, by the engineer of record uh, when they do their 40 scale uh, plan review for the site. So we don't have an answer to that question. Well, I don't think there is an exact answer of when the next earthquake is going to be, if, if that's your question. Well, if, it's Matt, been, uh, if I could suggest that- I can finish my question, Tom. 
Okay. If it's in here as a an important item, don't you think we should have a time frame? There, there really isn't a time frame. It's more of a probability analysis. So I can't, I can't give you a time frame of when the next seismic event could occur. Okay, no answer to that question. All right, uh, next question. Uh, the remediation, which is estimated to take up to two years. Okay, what is does this increase the likelihood of liquefaction during this mediation period? Um, I don't believe um, this site is going to be remediated for the liquefaction opportunity that exists there right now. So the grading takes care of um, that by replacing those uh, loose susceptible soils that are susceptible to liquefaction with an engineered fill. So that probability goes away by doing the remediation that's been proposed. All right, but while it's being disturbed over this two year period that they estimate it will take, does that enhance the likelihood of a slide? Of a slide? Yes. So the slide is uh, currently proposed to be remediated with a buttress system. Um, that buttress would be taking care of the basal rupture surface and all the landslide debris above it. That's not necessarily a liquefaction issue. That's more of a slope stability issue, but the proposed grading um, will take care of both those issues, both the liquefaction and the sliding issue. With regard to will that occur during grading? Um, that is if there was a seismic event during the grading operation, I guess that could be a potential until it is remediated. Okay. Um, we talk about uh, using engineered fill. Where does it come from and how is it engineered? So the fill material is the soils materials on site, which is the landslide materials, any bedrock materials, alluvium, and any existing fill that's on site gets picked up and reused and made into an engineered fill using a compaction standard. So the material on site is what's going to be used to create an engineered fill. And how was it being engineered? I suggest, I'm sorry, I was gonna suggest that Matt might wanna also cover the uh, stair step benching aspect of it that goes with that. That's also part of the engineering. Yes, that is true. So there will be a design shear key for this landslide the key is basically a notch in the ground that the fill is placed that gets below the basal rupture surface. As the fill is brought up across the site, it's, it's done what's called benching, which is a stair-stepped or terraced mechanism that's done by bulldozers into the side of the hill that locks in the engineered fill as it's brought up. Okay. Uh, next question has to do with the long-term settlement risk reduction. Um, what is the estimate of the range of the monitoring period that's gonna be used? Um, typically those are used for deeper fills. I believe there are some design fills once remedial removals are done that are on the order of 40 feet. Uh, commonly what is done is a settlement monument is put at the surface and it is monitored for a period of approximately four to six months um, after the completion of fill. Most of the fill will undergo um, it's settlement during grading, but it is then monitored for a period of time until uh, uh, this overall settlement reaches a threshold that is tolerable for the structures that are planned, foundation and building elements that are planned for the site. Okay. Uh, they talk about using acceptable engineering standards. What are they and who decides? Um, the standards are uh, industry-wide. Um, the recommendation for the buttress that is uh, being proposed is a very common technique used for landslides and slope stability um, all throughout Southern California, um, basically removing the weak materials and replacing it with a stronger uh, material, which in this case is the engineered fill. Um, 
the standards of how to place that, how to excavate it, um, how to add moisture to it and how to densify it is a standard that's uh, well known and has been uh, proposed and indicated within the uh, referenced reports. Okay, it says potential landslide hazards to adjacent properties would be reduced as compared to current properties, but are they eliminated? And who bears the liability if they're not? Um, I can't speak to the liability. Um, they will be greatly reduced. I don't know if necessarily they'd be eliminated because there's different types of landslides that could occur. What we are looking at here or what the consultant is looking at here is remediating the ancient landslide and the potential for the landslide debris, which is the more critical material to remediate that, to keep that from sliding uh, in a seismic event or in a heavy rain event. Um, but there could be some small type landslides that could occur, um, but those are, are much less than what uh, is being proposed to be fixed here, which would be greatly mitigated uh, with the proposed uh, uh, mitigation measures. Um, Matt, maybe you'd want to clarify if you're talking about throughout the whole site and you're talking about possible small slides on other slopes? Yes. Yes, that's a fair statement. I'm, I'm actually talking more about uh, some of the more native slopes in the area, the steep slopes, and those tend to get mitigated by, um, and these all come out during the, the grading plan stage, but again, this is common practice. Th they may have uh, uh, buildings located a certain way, small uh, impact walls, um, and things of that nature to design and direct any potential shallow, very shallow failure that could occur on the natural slopes. Okay, uh, slope stability. It says a licensed geotechnical engineer shall prepare a plan to achieve slope stability consistent with the above described requirements as part of the grading plan. Has this been done and where is the plan? Uh, yes, sir, it has been done. It's been shown to be feasible in the, uh, again, the various reference to geotechnical reports. Um, it's being done by the proposed uh, mitigation measures of doing the buttress replacement fill. And where is the plan? It's in the geotechnical reports, the referenced geotechnical reports. Okay, I didn't find it there, but I'll take another look. There is a, uh, usually an appendix attached to the report called slope stability, and the analysis is provided in there. How much water is going to be used during the remediation? We've had stories of a vast amount, more than two years supply for the neighboring cities. It seems to be a hell of a lot of water. Yes, they use a hell of a lot of water. I agree. Um, I don't know the quantity, but it does take a lot of water to create an engineered fill. As it is a mixture of both the soil and water, it's a design mechanism. Um, it will take a lot of bit, a lot of water to create to create this. Has the water district been apprised of the amount of water that's going to be used? I that I do not know. Commissioner Leah, um, I spoke briefly with our consultants who I believe contacted the water district over this issue. Um, Lindsay Sarkia, I think, can uh, shed a little bit more light on this issue for us. Right, sure. Lindsay? Yep, Lindsay Sarkia here. Um, Thank you, Robert. I believe you're referring to some calculations um, prepared by one of the commenters and submitted, I think, today or yesterday. Um, I have to say that the, the estimate of the water usage, potentially correct, but the comparison that was made to uh, water demand of these surrounding communities was inaccurate. Um, it was based on a table of cumulative water demand in the EIR, but that is of planned and pending projects in Agora Hills, um, Calabasas and local county areas, not of total supply available uh, from the water district. So in reality, when you compare the water that was estimated in that commenter's letter, the construction water against available supply, it's about 0.3% of Las Virginas water districts supply in a year. But we also contacted the district to understand the availability of recycled water for construction projects. And they indicated that uh, in addition to potable water that there is recycled water that they make available for construction. So this wouldn't necessarily be a demand against potable water. But you are aware that the district has sent out signals that there will be water restrictions again shortly. 
Um, I'm aware of that from some of the comment letters we've received, yep. correct? Right. The, the water restrictions you're referring to are for potable and the district yes. uh, year to year is always looking for new ways to be able to use their recycled water. They do not have enough demand for that. Okay, I think uh, I used up my 10 questions. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Commissioner Muller, John, any questions of staff or, or, or the uh, consultants? Yes, a few. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanna go back to the fire issues. What we heard earlier, well, we, we heard in from the chief that notwithstanding best practices, there was sufficient congestion during the Woolsey fire to create a situation which people, uh, this was pursuant to Mr. Leah's questions, couldn't get out. And that's what he said. And um, the earlier commentary by, I think it was the, uh, maybe it was Lindsay in, in uh, for Rincon, uh, talking about whether the EIR addresses the fire issues uh, cites us to, and this is in the slide presentation as well, topical response E, wildfire impacts. Uh, but when I read that today, it seemed to me that that was focused really exclusively on the impacts at the project and not the impacts among other residents in the area. For example, uh, the uh, uh, Section E says, in the event of mandatory evacuation orders issued in response to wildfire, project-related traffic would incrementally increase congestion on Las Virgins Road. However, the project is sited approximately 0.25 miles from US 101, which would be the primary evacuation route for Calabasas residents. And the next sentence is, therefore, project residents and employees would be able to quickly access US 101 from the project site. So basically that's saying, if I read it correctly, project residents, that means the people in this project and, and employees there would be able to get out quickly, but it doesn't address the impact, the environmental impact of uh, wildfires on the community at large. And doesn't, aren't those environmental impacts that ought to have been analyzed in order to make this section uh, of the AR adequate? So that could, I'm gonna have other questions, but I'll leave it at that for now. Is that a question or just a uh, no, no, that's a, it's a question. Why, why, has, why wasn't the impact, the wildfire impact on the residents in the general corridor, many of whom were unable to get out before this project was built, why wasn't that analyzed and shouldn't it be analyzed? Okay, I, I'm gonna start a little bit and then I'd like to invite um, Scott Shell to jump in because he was looking at the traffic and you're talking about people evacuating basically by automobile, private vehicles. So first of all, um, any given fire is gonna have its own unique evacuation pattern and requirements depending on where the fire is, the magnitude of the fire, neighborhoods that may be affected. So it's virtually impossible to do an analysis that is comprehensive that would model and it's some infinite number of possible uh, situations. You just can't do it. Which roads are they going to close? Which roads are they going to use as primary routes? As you heard from Assistant Fire Chief Smith, you know, the command is going to make decisions at the time and moment based on conditions at the time and moment. And um, the evacuation numbers that he quoted for the Woolsey fire were um, something he'd not even had to take on before. 250,000 individuals were having to be evacuated at the same time. And this project, in terms of an added number of persons compared to that number of persons is 0.2%. And the point behind uh, the proximity to evacuation routes, namely, and particularly Highway 101, which is the primary route out of this area, is that this project and its residents would be out and out of the way in a very quick amount of period of time and not impactful generally on other residents that are in more outlying areas. So having said that much, I'd like to get um, um, Scott Shell on. 
Well, it sounds like that already is the answer, or you, that's your that's the answer you're presenting to Commissioner Mueller. Although I don't know how responsive it is, but uh, does Mr. Who, who, who's, does Mr. Shell, does Scott Shell have anything additional to say? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Scott Shell again with Associated Transportation Engineers. I think that the next paragraph or sentence in the paragraph that Commissioner Mueller was reading goes on to state that the project is going to provide improvements within the corridor to enhance emergency evacuation. So it would have been a good question for the fire chief to say, if we were to give you another full lane on Las Virginas Road, starting south of Agura Road and, and going straight to the 101 freeway with two lanes onto the southbound on-ramp, would that improve emergency evacuation? I think that the answer is clearly yes. You know, just the ballpark numbers, uh, an additional lane of capacity on the road would serve about 2,000 cars an hour. So that's a, a capacity number that we're we're going to have an extra 2,000 cars an hour are going to be able to clear that barrel onto the freeway. Uh, the project evacuation, if every single unit had one car leaving uh, at the evacuation order, that's 180 cars. And so from our perspective, just uh, you know, mathematically, the provision of the roadway improvements uh, outweigh the additional traffic that would be added by the project. Well, I don't want to argue with you, Scott. I appreciate the comment, but again, I think you were talking just now about the additional lane for purposes of egress of the project residents as opposed to the impact it might have on the upstream people. In other words, yes, that's going to help the, peop the people in the project get out quicker. No, it actually, it has actually a benefit, not just it's it's on Las Virginis, so it helps all traffic on Las Virginis. But you're Maybe, also Scott, assuming. Can you explain? That, well, wait, but you're also making a big assumption that the freeway is, is not well. It's not going to be expanded, so I'm not sure how adding a couple of extra lanes to get on the freeway is going to speed anything up. It can't. I mean, just just mathematically cannot because if the freeway is closed or if the freeway is impacted, it's not going to speed it up. It's totally nonsensical. It is nonsensical. So anyway, why don't you go to your next question then, John? Okay, and I just, um, and I'll, I guess I'll save this for comment, but really my point is not so much that Tom, you're not correct, or Scott, you're not correct. You may well be, but I don't see that depth of analysis in the report. I see a few sentences, gee, we're gonna have another lane, and gee, the project guys are gonna be, able, the project residents are gonna be able to get out quickly. I don't see a, a careful analysis especially in light of the evidence that was, that was in existence at the time of the EIR, namely on the congestion during Woolsey. So mm -hmm. it's the absence of the analysis that is troubling me, not that your uh, factual statements aren't correct, they probably are. Um, okay, so um, let me turn to the issue of, of the housing uh, accountability issues. So what I'm hearing is that um, alternative five is an environmentally superior alternative to the proposed project. And we know alternative five has 147 versus 180 units. And I think that I heard from last week, alternative five was fully vetted. And I think I, I heard and correct me if I'm wrong that Alternative five, if that were uh, adopted, would satisfy the project um, goals. And even though it would produce fewer affordable housing units than the 180 units, uh, that nevertheless, the, ho the housing accountability goals and the no, let, no net loss goals and the RENA goals would still be accommodated with alternative five. And let me just stop and ask is Tom, is that, did I understand that correctly or, or not? They would be, uh, hold on here. Am I muted? I can't remember. No. Okay. Uh, they would be uh, sufficiently addressed. We would still be making inroads to the um, Rainer requirements under the current fifth cycle housing element. And I have to emphasize fifth cycle because the requirements in the next one are different. Um, but for the reasons Matt summarized in his slide, where we would, of course, have to make some findings, and we 
confident, we're confident we would be able to make those. Uh, we could proceed with that. So then my question is, um, who came up with 147 in alternative five as opposed to some other number? Well, <clears throat> what we asked for, because uh, alternative four was proving to be infeasible and having to go into the rejected column, um, we felt there had to be a what I'll call a replacement alternative that still would address the intent of alternative four. The alternative four intent of people are looking at it as its intent was to not remediate the landslide. But behind that was the fundamental intent to not have the aesthetic impact and the biological impact that went with that. The biological impact became clear, which by the way is mostly temporary, but um, the landslide has to be remediated. So with that having been answered, then the aesthetic impact question remains open and alternative four um, had gone away. So we wanted something that would improve upon that. We asked the developer to come up with an alternative that would not worsen any other impact and yet improve the aesthetic impact. They came up with that alternative. I mean, they discussed concepts with us first so that we could at least say, that looks like that's going to address it. You determine whether that's something you could do and submit it. Then having that, we went to our consultants and had it reviewed as part of the EIR and the EIR amendment. Okay, but, but to your knowledge, no one has evaluated the aesthetic impact benefit or gain uh, from a smaller number of units. For example, if you were to reduce the 180, which we all know is a maximum number, it's not the permitted number, it's maximum, um, by 25%, you'd get 135 units, by 30%, you'd get 126 units. Now, fewer units has less environmental impact, including, presumably, depending on how it's arranged, less uh, aesthetic impact just by simple arithmetic, isn't that correct? Well, you're definitely right. And that's something that the commission would have the ability to look at. Not, you're not necessarily limited to the alternatives in the IR. Right. With the alternative right. analysis in an EIR, because remember, an EIR is an informational document. It's intended to inform the public and the decision makers of potential environmental impacts and part of the intent to inform those people of possible environmental impacts is to also consider a range of alternatives so they could see how those environmental impacts might vary depending on how you modify the project. In your hypothetical, if you took the project itself and simply eliminated a building or two on the front end, or what I'll call the west side, right? Closest to Las Virginas, that would improve the aesthetic impact in terms of an immediate upfront set of buildings that block for the passersby more of the ridge lines and that sort of thing. That's largely what alternatives two and three accomplish. So we did look at that. Um, Alternative five was intended to basically do the same thing and you'll see they have that kind of a setback. Okay, I don't wanna dominate any more time, Mr. Chairman. That's, that's all I have for now. Oh, thanks. Um, Commissioner Washburn, Dennis, do you, can you unmute? Do you have any questions for the staff? Um, I'd like to reserve my comments until after everybody's had a chance to put their, because I took a lot of time on the whole fire thing. So uh, let me hear everybody else. And then I have a few things I want to bring up. Okay. These are just questions. We can get to comments after our questions, but then Commissioner Milstein. Yeah, I had uh, just two things I wanted to ask. Um, this project's one of three identified sites in the city's general plan. Um, under the Housing Accountability Act, says that law requires local jurisdictions to not deny or render infeasible a housing project that is consistent with the general plan and the zoning rules. Um, unless there's a preponderance of evidence that both the following exist, um, either a specific adverse impact on public health and safety um, 
for the air quality. So I wanted to find out is um, South Coast air quality management thresholds, are we gonna be for sure under those thresholds during construction? This is Lindsay Sarkia from Rincon Consultants. Uh, Glenn, Tom, I'll, I'll take that question. We, we modeled um, the, what, with information about the construction of the project that is, that is available at this time, a reasonable um, and feasible construction schedule, equipment usage, uh, worker trips, things like that, uh, in a model called the California um, Emissions Estimate Model that's prepared by South Coast Air Quality Management District. And when we compared those numbers in our model to the thresholds, they were below, as you state. Um, the project is you know, required to be, to be built in accordance with the project description that we, we analyzed. And so the expectation is that they will be below those thresholds and they, they are required uh, to be below those thresholds. Okay. And the other question I had was, um, so currently the site's in our arena obligation under the fifth cycle housing element. If it's included in the sixth cycle element, the developer would be able to do this project by right. Um, my question is, is the city able to not list it in the sixth cycle? And if that's possible, is there any other sites identified to replace this one? Maybe some commercial space that um, with the pandemic is falling demand to the commercial property? Um, could it be replaced in the next arena cycle? Um, <clears throat> first of all, before, before I get to that second part, um, the first part you mentioned, which is uh, if it were to be uh, kept in the inventory, uh, this project would have to be able to be approved by right. Um, that's part of it, that, that would be true. Um, but more importantly, any project would have to be approved by right that would conform to the zoning. And so it could be 180 units configured some other way um, that at least meets our standards for setback height and everything else. And you might be looking at quite a bit more commercial or a configuration of buildings that is more impactful uh, environmentally, but we would not be reviewing it that way. It'd have to be by right. So I wanna make that clear. Um, now, other sites, we're absolutely already, based on what we've been hearing so far, um, working on that in terms of the six cycles so that we would be prepared to address that. It would mean that um, because we don't have a lot of, quote, additional sites available, we already went through the options, as you know, um, intensifying with greater density, for example, through a a more robust affordable housing overlay, um, it being dens densifying these other sites that we've already identified. Okay. That's the only two questions I had. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I don't have any questions. So uh, next would just be commissioner comments, but I have a question if it's all right to take a, a, a break for a few minutes for like five minutes. Is... Yep, good idea. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or do you want longer, like 10, but at least five, I think. Uh, five minutes is enough. Okay, so five minutes. Can we just take a short break, uh, staff, and, and just return after that? Okay, thanks very much.
Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I didn't know I was muted even. You don't know all the time because it's it's in a corner somewhere. I needed the break. Thank you. Oh, if you need another break, then you know. No. Yeah. Right. Right. And Dennis, you said you wanted to go last in this part on the comments. Uh, I'm I'm there, so I, I, I'm ready to you, I, I'm ready to make my comments. Oh, oh, so you don't? Okay, so we'll just go in, in the same order, I guess. Okay, uh, just a moment, Chair. I'm going to put you back on air in one second. Okay. And okay, thank you. Well Okay, I'm going to put you on air and you can go ahead and begin in five seconds. All right. All right, I guess we can resume. Uh, I forgot to mention that this is file number 16000-3152. So uh, we're now at the point where the commissioners uh, will make comments. And then after that, we can deliberate and see where we want to go. Um, so first, I guess in the same order is Commissioner Leah. Okay. We need to talk about traffic and circulation because that's the house of cards on which this whole thing is built. Lost Hills. The roadway provides one of the major north-south travel routes in the western portion of the city of Calabasas. In fact, it's the only one. The infamous Z traffic that floods the city from the cities to the west, the valley, Malibu, and West LA was totally ignored in the traffic study. The Lost Hills Road 101 ramps were ignored. Traffic from the west exits at Lost Hills Road, turns left onto Agora Road, right onto Las Virginis Road, and tries to enter the freeway at the 101 ramp or goes to Muro Road and turns right. Western Calabasas is a bedroom community. Peak traffic from four to six is ludicrous. Five to seven more realistic. Local schools are closed by that time. Caltrans, Caltrans signal timing has a little effect on local intersections. When they talk about level of service, they say Bureau Road is worse than the 101 southbound. That's insanity. Again, they have no idea the throw. The only time people go up to 101 is when the, when the uh, freeway is loaded. We talk about, oh, there goes my camera, excuse me. <clears throat> they talk about traffic down Las, uh, Las Virgenes Road, they're gonna put additional lanes. When it's jammed up, what, how difference is additional lanes gonna make? The freeway is stopped, additional lanes are not gonna help. People are not gonna be able to get out of the project. People can't make a turn from Agora Road onto Lost Hills Road. It's one bloody gridlock. It makes no sense at all. Residential condos, when they were talking about the 180 units, they said only 65 a.m. trips and 79 p.m. trips. What do the people stay in all day? They don't leave? They said trip distribution and assignment based on existing traffic patterns in the project area and input from the city staff. How about from the residents? They live here. 
You think they agree with this report? I don't think so. The fact that the traffic support that they put in here, which makes everything else seem okay, does not apply. It's false and misleading and needs to be totally ignored. I'd like to come back with my other comments on some other things later on. Yeah, sure. On those. sure. All right. So, um, uh, John, Commissioner Muller. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, start by briefly touching on the action of June 2019. Staff is correct that we denied the resolution then, uh, that, that was then pending, and that we urged staff and the applicant to come up with one or more alternatives. Staff and I think the city attorney stated that we needed a resolution with necessary findings that would support a denial of the resolution and that one would be drafted for our consideration. I voted to deny the proposed resolution for one main reason. I felt that the evidence did not support the wholesale landslide remediation that was then and now proposed. Uh, the evidence in 2019, I felt demonstrated that the landslide had not moved in forever, notwithstanding years of heavy rains, some significant seismic events, and the lack of debris in the basins, and the testimony that if there were a slide, it was unlikely to reach Las Virgenes or the planned development. I was hoping that the applicant could come back with what we called at the time alternative 4.5 or 4.7 or something like that, that would not require the total remediation of the ancient landslide area because the area is zoned and designated open space and because at least at the time it was heavily wooded with oaks. What we now have based on no new data, but rather reevaluated data is a situation in which the applicant city staff and consultants essentially state that there is no reasonable development that can take place on the subject site without total remediation of the landslide area, whether the, whether the development is 180 units as proposed or alternative five with 146 units or some variation with fewer units. We have heard that prudent engineering requires design levels which provide a standard of care to apply safety factors depending on the landslide risks. We heard and read about surficial, gross, and pseudostatic seismic risks. We heard that just because the landslide is called inactive and dormant, that is only because there is no visual evidence of a problem, but that the slide could reactivate any time. We read in uh, the consultant Layton's reevaluation of the data that the landslide presents a risk to life and property that is too high. And the consultant LGC says alternative four with no landslide remediation, quote, is far too risky based on, quote, a comprehensive reassessment. And we heard about modified alternative four involving a hundred million dollar project of caissons. Frankly, when I read that and heard the testimony about it, I thought it was a bit of a straw man. I doubt anyone seriously thought that that was anywhere near a realistic alternative. So what are we left with on the landslide issue? Rather than a hope for alternative with minimal remediation, we have a conclusion from the applicant and city's consultants that now, almost two years later, that the landslide must be fully eliminated and the area remediated or no development at all will be safe. If I'm exaggerating, someone can correct me. Now, if the applicant and staff are correct, then one question remains. Can the landslide be fully remediated given the zoning and designation? It's a legal question. If the answer is no, then it follows there can be no development on this site. If the answer is yes, then the landslide can be fully and lawfully remediated notwithstanding the zoning and designation. But what are the odds that such a decision will stand up to a challenge? How certain is the city? What is the precedent that supports that conclusion? Is remediating dangerous land an exception to the general rule concerning the protection of hillside development and open space designation? I do understand that um, Glenn and others have addressed this and basically have concluded that 
uh, the kind of activity that will be done to remediate the landslide is well within the general policies that Glenn uh, cited. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that the words that are in those policies, such as grading and slope stability, uh, constitute the level of remediation that is proposed here. Um, the next issue for me is the adequacy of the EIR. We've talked a lot about the fire risk uh, as I went through in questions of the chief and other representatives. I don't think that, that there was a very expansive analysis of the risk to the residents other than the project residents. Uh, I do agree that uh, that there are some remediation, remediations such as the added lane, putting aside the freeway issue, which will help the project residents and potentially the other residents as well. Um, 180 units is not a massive number of units for evacuation purposes to add to the already large number of, of uh, houses and condos and apartments in the area. Woolsey was unique. The fire chief said, uh, we're not gonna have enough fuel to have another Woolsey for 20 years. It doesn't mean there can't be some other significant disaster in the, uh, in the area. Um, so I think it's a close call whether on the fire issue alone, we can certify the EIR. I think we can, but I would not be surprised uh, uh, that a challenge to that certification uh, would not be successful. Um, I was going to make some comments about the wildlife corridor, uh, but I think those were addressed, raised and addressed earlier tonight, so I won't repeat those. And so let me go finally to uh, the issue of the alternatives. And I've raised this a little bit with uh, Tom Bartlett a few minutes ago. Um, so well, I understand that an EIR is an informational document and it can identify superior alternatives. What we have here is an alternative uh, four, which is now off the books because of the evidence, and there isn't any contrary evidence, the evidence of the consultants uh, all basically say the landslide has to be remediated or no project. Um, if that's true, then the question is what project? And the applicant is proposing the full 180 unit, but basically suggested an alternative five, which is 146 units uh, with a different configuration and getting some more distance from Las Virgenas and from the colony. Um, I suggest that alternative five is better than the proposed project. Is it better enough? Are there alternatives? Is there, is there a tweaking to alternative five, call it alternative six or eight, I don't care what we call it, which would be an alternative that would better and more thoroughly uh, reduce the aesthetic impacts, which is the impact that the EIR says cannot be eliminated uh, to less than significant. Um, there are project goals that have to be achieved, housing goals. The pro project proponent has a right to develop its project and to make it a profitable one. That's a legitimate goal. Not for us, but for the applicant, it certainly is. So I'm wondering if we, if we get to the point, I'm just throwing this out, Mr. Chairman, that we may get to the point this evening where I would propose something that would be um, less intrusive and more restrictive than even alternative five uh, that could be configured in a way that would meet project goals but would but would better um, and would better lessen the aesthetic impacts. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Then we go to Commissioner Washburn for comments. And I think you have to unmute again. And I wanted to see if um, our attorney is on the screen. Are you there, Matt? Yes, of course. Um, This is probably the naughtiest project since Amundsen Ranch that I've had to deal with. And um, in that instance, if you recall, folks, um, 
you know, we resisted and evaluated and analyzed and proposed and did all kinds of stuff. Ultimately, um, we came to the conclusion that if you want to save a piece of land like that, you have to buy it. So we got the people of California to buy it and we don't have Amundsen Ranch and 3,050 homes up there and police stations and schools and golf courses and everything else. And that's not the case in this, um, in this development. However, um, what I'd like to know is what can we five commissioners do at this point? Because it seems to me that if the issues of the landslide or any of the other environmental things, you know, you know become um, something that we can't make a good decision on, it's going to go to the city council and they're going to have to deal with the overriding considerations that are probably going to be necessary in order to approve any of the projects that have been proposed to us at this point. And having been a council member, you know, I know the, the, you deal with those decisions of overriding considerations of the law of liability and, you know, what you're willing to risk of the people's, uh, you know, trust and treasure in Calabasas. So, you know, the, the things that each of the commissioners has raised makes it very difficult, I can see at this point, other than to do what might be appropriate. And maybe you could give me some counsel on this, Matt. It seems to me that, you know, we have two decisions in front of us, essentially. We have Exhibit B, which is Resolution 714, and we have Exhibit A, which is Resolution 713. And uh, neither seems to be totally adequate for the kinds of things that we've been talking about tonight and being presented with. So um, we could talk for an hour about, you know, the reasons that we don't want to finance uh, the sales of the units once they're built, because we talked about that, you know, two years ago. Um, and that was a prime reason, you know, no one's going to buy a unit if they can't get it insurance or if they can't you know, get uh, protection of, of you know, life and property. So that's not a decision that the, the, council, the commission can make. You know, we're here to determine whether we've adequately studied all the alternatives and all the things that we can think of. I, I have to commend everybody on the staff and all the consultants because um, I, I literally come in and in fact, I got 34 pounds or 35 pounds worth of documentation since 2019 that I've had to, you know, struggle with and understand and deal with my colleagues on and so forth. And it, it's an amazing amount of work and everybody is doing the right thing. And the developer or the applicant, you know, has been right there with us all, you know, trying to figure out a way to get what they need and want out of this project. And they've done an amazing amount of work as well. But the problem is, ultimately, um, how are we going to get to overriding considerations? So um, <clears throat> I'm going I'm to I'm try something if I can. And I'd like to actually put a motion on the floor and then we can have discussion on the motion. Well, Dennis, I wanted to freely make comments first, and then you can make a motion. You can okay. make them on the motion or without uh, dealing with the uh, with the motion as well. But I'd like to actually move, if I can get a second, that we um, send both B and A to the council, and that would be to say, uh, if we are to approve um, alt alternative five because it is less uh, onerous uh, than all the other alternatives that we've dealt with for two years. And we have in fact exhausted our ability to evaluate and analyze and reanalyze and refocus on all this stuff. If we send a resolution of denial, B, and send A along with and say that if in fact Alt-5 can be wrestled to the ground by the council members who do in fact have the responsibility to deal with the overriding considerations and the legal and liability and um, you know ultimate certification and approval of the of the concepts so I would say let's send both resolutions um, if the 
if our attorney says that that's feasible with a recommendation that, you know, we're at our wits end at this point. Um, and it's up to the council to try to deal with the issues that we've raised here and before and that are in the documentation that's 34 pounds worth. I'm happy to clarify the motion before you see uh, there, whether there is a second. As I understand it, the motion would be to adopt um, resolution number 2021-713, which is exhibit A with adjustments to recommend approval of alternative five to the city council with direction to staff to make the necessary adjustments to approve alternative five to the council. And then also to adopt resolution 2021-714, which is exhibit B, uh, recommending that the council together deny the project itself. That's my understanding of your motion, Commissioner Washburn. Well, that's- And that would be legal. That's kind of where I'm going because you know we're, we're at um, a dilemma point here and um, we don't have the power. You know, We have the responsibility to judge whether the, the, we've ex extended all of our legal responsibilities to everybody concerned, the applicant, the staff and all of their uh, capability and to all the people who have been engaged in this process, not just on this project, but in life in Calabasas, because it, it is our, as a community, responsibility. So if, if that's the proper form, then I would suggest that's the nature of my motion. And it's not to pass it, it's to discuss it at this point. So everyone gets to deal with the idea of what do we do now and where does it go? Because it has to go to the council for any final determination on all right, it. All right. Is there a second on the motion by any other commissioner? Hearing none. Okay, so we'll go on, Dennis. Any other comments? That's all I'm going to say. Okay, then, uh, Commissioner Milstein. You... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 I actually I don't have any comments. I'm just listening to everybody. I'm I'm good. Okay, I, I uh, thank you. I have a, a lot of comments because I haven't been able to really speak. And then, and then we can try to formulate something. I mean, and, and get back to what Dennis was uh, talking about, which I, you know, may come up. But first, I want to talk about the landslide because I think that's just a red herring. I, I mean, everyone knows the landslide is ancient and hasn't moved in what a thousand or more years. And if it was so important, why didn't we have a map of the landslide in the 3,000 pages we were given in 2019? Not one map. And why was alternative four included, which Rincon said was completely viable? I mean, the response we were given to that question is not credible. Uh, I, the map geology information that we were given last week uh, was, uh, was quite interesting, but that's because my undergraduate degrees in geography, like Tom Bartlett's, but the other landslide testimony given last week was just not credible to me at all. The claim that absolutely nothing could be built anywhere on the two parcels is just not credible. And if that geologist knew all that years ago when he was working for the city of Calabasas on the general plan, why didn't he mention it when they, they were doing the general plan updates? Why were there no maps before? And also if, there, if we are gonna have the worst expected earthquake staff reported that the landslide could slip several feet. And as I said two years ago, that's nothing. There are a lot of other slides in the city, like a couple in my neighborhood, which are far more serious than that. And this landslide isn't even monitored, so it's not even a remote threat. Um, last week, we heard from Greg Byrne that the real reason they want to remove the landslide is, has to do with money, not safety. And I want to talk about uh, traffic, uh, which uh, Commissioner Leo was talking about, and greenhouse gases, because the staff report and the EIR both claim that this project will improve traffic and help California meet its greenhouse gas goals, which I just, I, that just couldn't be less credible. Um, just changing the signal at Las Virginis and Agoura Road, if you're familiar with that, from a two-way signal to a four-way signal is going to double the time it takes to get through the intersection. The, the report says there are going to be two additional uh, signals, what, one going left from a Las Virginis north on Agora and one going left from the project south on Las Virginis. If you add that to the existing rush hour traffic that I've personally seen going through that, where it takes about three, that takes at least three green lights to get through 
uh, uh, from Aguro to, to Las Virgenes, it's just, it's just going to create even more gridlock. Um, I think that's why the commercial element is included in this project, um, because the applicant can say that the project, uh, the, the residents of the project are going to go to the cleaners there and go buy a cup of coffee at the Starbucks that they put in there and go to the restaurant there. But there's no fi financial viability in any of those commercial projects. And that's why the traffic studies are false. I mean, if you look at Avanti, which they developed, the commercial space upstairs has been empty since it was built. And the downstairs is all empty except for the juice uh, store. So the, the commercial uses, the purported commercial uses here are just a red herring to come up with lower traffic counts, but it's, it's not credible. Now, touching on the general plan. The, the general plan says this is supposed to be a village, but it's not a village in any dictionary I've looked at. And on page 2-20 of the general plan EIR, which Rincon wrote, it says that the project is going to be developed to create a village feel. But to me, this looks more like a public housing site plan. It's not a village site plan. And the general plan itself on page 9-16 states that a welcoming pedestrian level presence at street level along Las Virgenes is a key element of this, plan, of this project. That's missing. It says that the buildings are envisioned to maintain good building form, including setbacks and balconies. That's all missing. It says high quality iconic architecture will follow architectural direction in the Las Virgenes Gateway Master Plan. All of that is missing. Um, as far as the OSDR zone, you know, the open space development restricted zone, grading and, and drainage structures are strictly prohibited in this zone, and that cannot be waived. So that project cannot be approved for that reason alone. Um, in, in the second paragraph of the slide of slide 18 that we saw earlier tonight, it's just pure fabrication. It's, that's all it is. There's no mention in the, in the development code of, quote, permanent human occupancy type land uses, end quote, as being the only precluded development in open space. Um, if you look at the, at, the, at the definition of development, which is on page 339 of Title se uh, 17 of the development code, which I mentioned two years ago, and apparently nobody looked at it, it says, and I quote, development means any grading or construction activity or alteration of the land, its terrain contour or vegetation. So it even excludes public utility structures, though you can't even put that in the open space. You can't have grading, you can't have development, you can't have terrain contour, or, or, or contour uh, modification or vegetation. You can't even have a cable box, let alone two miles of cement V ditches. This proposed project, project also violates the scenic corridor ordinance, as I mentioned two years ago. All the street trees they put on their plan violate the ordinance. The applicant had two years to fix it and didn't. On the Las Virgenes Gateway Master Plan, it's not just a, not a village which is envisioned, but it's got Spanish colonial architecture which isn't permitted, but that could still be fixed. As far as fire, which I think is one of the biggest problems here, the EIR response 8.7 on page 155 is just false. Basically, it says that because the project is built to code, and we heard the same thing tonight, there will be no impact from wildland fires or to emergency evacuation. It's, it's the same response to so many other comments that uh, which we received uh, raising other concern. It's to code, so it's all good. But that response is not logical. Just because something is built to code doesn't make it safe. I mean, we used to have lead in pipes. We used to have lead in paint. We used to have asbestos on ceilings. We used to have asbestos in ducting. All of that was to code, but it's not safe. And here, all, all, all those soft story buildings in the, in, which collapsed in the, 19, uh, in the Northridge earthquake, they were all built to code. I had a friend of mine, an old friend of mine named Matt Kupferman, who died in one of those buildings which collapsed. So 
a couple of years ago, I told you about the big fire in the 90s when all the evacuating students at A.E. Wright were stuck in buses, which could not move on Las Virginis. Uh, the Chief Smith pointed out or reminded me it was in 1997. So, so that may be right. Every 20 years, there's a major fire. But the buses, the traffic could not move on Las Virginis. Didn't matter. You, you could add another lane. It wouldn't matter. You've got an extra 500 residents. They're not going anywhere. There were flames on the hills all around them. And John Suarez spoke last week about fire in the 1980s. And last year, we saw fires in Topanga. We had 121 degrees in Woodland Hills. We had choking smoke for days. Since July 1st, this year, we've had 4.7 inches of rainfall at my station in Calabasas Park. So that's one third of normal. We're in a major drought again. In, if, in this project, scores of residents won't be able to even drive to, La, to Las Virginis. So they'll have to run or walk to Las Virginis to escape the flames. Remember, th there are units that are two blocks away from Las Virginis, two blocks east. Um, on top of the impacts to the residents of this project, the burning buildings in this project will set off fires in the colony and throughout the neighborhood. And I think John was touching on that a little bit. And that was demonstrated in the report put out by the Center for Biological Di Diversity in February called Built to Burn, which was submitted with the comments that we received. And that report demonstrates that when new buildings, new buildings hardened as they may be, when new buildings have been constructed uh, on the fringe of the wild, uh, wild line, wildland fringe, fires are more widespread. It just makes sense. The project basically adds more fuel to the and more connected buildings to the fire zone. If this project is approved, it's not just building homes, it's building a bigger fire next time around. And by the way, that report was written by somebody who has more credentials than anyone here, anyone we listen to tonight, anyone. So you should take a look at it. And as Jolie Wildet pointed out last week, and I pointed out two years ago, residents of this project may not be able to get fire insurance. Forget you know, building insurance. They're not gonna get fire insurance. The HOA, our, my HOA, which has 490 homes near Bay Laurel, we our policy was canceled. And so were many other HOAs. And I'm in Calabasas Park. Uh, this area is probably even you know, more dangerous. We finally found one a day before our, our policy uh, ended and it was triple the cost. And that happened to many other HOAs. I, I think this EIR will be thrown out if they get a judge like Judge Beckloff. It'll be thrown out in two seconds, just like the one that was thrown out for Centennial and Fort Tejon. That's a city up uh, in Northern California, a projected city, the proposed city in Northern uh, Los Angeles County. But even if it's revised and approved, the attorney general may bring suit against the city and the applicant for building in a deadly fire zone like this. And whatever is ultimately built here, we need a real plan, a real analysis for saving people in a wildfire. Talk about, you know, shelter in place, shelter in what, in a fire trap? Uh, in Australia, they require wildlife safety bunkers, like the one, uh, and, and, and they, need what, they need safety bunkers for everybody in this project and in the colony. And that may, that may cost a lot, but that would be far more useful in addressing the true hazards of this project. There was no analysis of that in the, in the EIR. And, and the sprinklers, I think, is a great idea, but not landscape sprinklers. This, it needs fire sprinklers, sprinklers on top of the roof so everything is watered. Uh, and we may even need a, uh, since we have all this reclaimed water that can't be used, they should build a reservoir for the reclaimed water and conceal it, just like the reservoir up on Dirt Mulholland in, um, Tarzana, which is concealed. Um, anyway, and finally, I would ask the applicant to post a security bond, a, a, a surety bond or security bond to replace the buildings in this project and in the colony after they burned every 20 years. I mean, why should those foreseeable costs be shifted to the city or to the county or to the state or to FEMA or to the SBA or to the insurance companies or to the victims and their families? I mean, just how many more Matt Kupfermans are gonna have to die from this built to code fire trap? Um, I've already said this, this project basically doesn't comply with state and municipal laws and it's disrespectful of the 
physical and natural environment, disrespectful of geology, disrespectful of biology, water and air. It's just disrespectful of the businesses and residences in our community. I mean, a couple of years ago, I said this project was like Amundsen Ranch 2.0, but actually it's worse. It's just disrespectful of human life. It's, uh, it is a lethal project. So yeah, it's a lethal project. That, those are my comments. Now we get to discuss how we want to move forward. So uh, the floor is open. Can I uh, just finish up those comments uh, I took sure. a pause on before? I'll yeah. be very, very brief. No, go ahead. The general plan, uh, I don't know how many times they've shown how where this project complies with the general plan, but they conveniently omit where it fails to comply with the general plan. For example, they talk about the ridge, line, ridge lines will not be affected. The general plan talks about the rolling hills that we're supposed to preserve. If people who are standing in the Albertsons looking at it, it's totally blocked out. The hillsides are gone. I would not subject these communities to a water shortage because we're pouring into the ground. And lastly, uh, if I may comment just briefly on Dennis's suggestion, to me, we would be abdicating our responsibility. I'm, I'm done. All right, anybody else, more comments? And then we can talk about how to proceed. Well, Go ahead. I, I'd like to make a final comment on you know the resolutions that are before us here, because that's the action that we're supposed to take, I believe. Um, as in all of the resolutions for uh, approving a development after the study and analysis and recommendations are done. Uh, there are 183 conditions that have to be undertaken in order to complete this project. And I'm not saying that we should approve either A or B at this point, but the fact is that our staff and we have done the work necessary to have all the conditions that would be necessary to consider when you're when you're dealing with the other issues the overriding conditions that i mentioned the legal or liability or insurance or recovery requirements that are going to be made by the city council so my my thought was to send them on you know with a, basically an expectation that as the project is standing before us it is deniable, but with all the work that's gone into dealing with all the issues, and many of them you just raised yourself, Michael, um, it may be that it's not our purview at this point to deal with that issue. You've raised the, the subject matter, as have I and Bob and John and Dan Daniel, and the staff has done so as well, and they've had the hard task of literally trying to um, accommodate the impacts and or the opportunities that are here. So at this point, uh, I would like to ask Matt to evaluate where we stand and what are the steps that we need to take to move forward, either send us on to the council or um, in, in either case, you know, if it's denial or approval, it still has to go to the council. It's their decision in the end, not ours. Right. It, it's just a recommendation that we're, we can't make a final decision on the project, but we can just make a recommendation. We can adopt a, a or B or make up our own C. <laughs> Absolutely. The commission, at this point, my recommendation is that the commission make a decision. Which decision is not my choice. It is your choice. But my recommendation is you make a decision forward the matter to the city council and then they can consider it further. John, you had a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, comment. Um, I don't think it's necessary to give the council A and B. B, the denial is, is, part, of the, is part of the staff report. And if the council wants to deny it based on the findings set forth in exhibit B, they can do that whether we forward exhibit A or not. So I don't, Dennis, I don't really understand why we would need to give them exhibit B and say, gee, if you want to deny, here, here are the words. They have that already. Um, my other comment is um, I, I would personally 
I just a quick footnote. I mean, I remember, I remember because I read it in history that the Compromise of 1850, which at least put off the Civil War 15 years, was actually six or seven pieces of legislation cobbled together with different majorities in each of the houses to ultimately achieve the Compromise of 1850. Hearing the comments tonight, I think we're probably uh, uh, as diverse a group as was present back then. Uh, so, so I would propose a compromise. My compromise would be to send to the council, and I should just drop a footnote here, I'm very mindful of, of Michael Harrison's well-articulated comments. I'm very mindful of all of the comments, and I read all of them, I listened to all of them from the public. Um, but I'm also mindful of uh, Mr. Schoenfeld's comments, which is, while I don't think we're, we have to approve a development, I mean, he's right. This area was, is, is, is designated in the general plan for a development of some sort, of some size, as much as 180. And I don't want to lose sight of that. So my compromise would be to send to the council a, uh, uh, an approval of, a, of Exhibit A but a modification. I don't want to send them exhibit A with 180 units. And I don't really want to send them alternative five, although that's better than the proposal. I would suggest that, that we uh, approve alternative five with, a, uh, with a, a, a modification. And that modification would be that the total number of units would be uh, 135 as opposed to 146. And I get to the 135 because that's a 25% reduction in what the project proponent, in the, in the project that's before us. And I think that would help be, that we could configure that or it could be configured by staff to help reduce the significant visual impacts uh, and then achieve the overriding condition finding that needs to be found. Um, I can't remember if it was Henry Clay or who the guy was. Henry who was a compromiser. I'm certainly not in his league, but I'm trying to find some way that is um, sends this thing back for another two years of, of iteration. And the and the uh, uh, lawyer said tonight, Mr. Schoenfeld, give us a decision tonight. So that would be my decision. I understand that people may disagree, but those are my uh, ideas, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you. Uh, anybody else has, ha, does anybody else have any ideas <laughs> how to go forward? Or do we each issue our own opinion? Uh, was that- We could do that like the Supreme from, Court. Was right, right, right. No, uh, preferably not. Was that a motion, Commissioner Mueller? I'm, I'm happy to make that as a motion. The motion would be to, to um, uh, send to the city council exhibit A, um, but modify it so that it would be uh, not only alternative five, but it would be uh, lesser than alternative five in terms of units, namely no more than 135 units with an effort to reduce the visual, um, is that the visual impacts to the maximum extent possible given that number of units. John, does that include in that case, um, a disposition to the uh, apparently unavoidable landslide repair. The the motion would include the landslide repair. It just as the just as Exhibit A includes the landslide repair, my motion would include that the landslide be remediated as proposed by the consultants that we heard last week. I wish that we'd had the. Uh, uh, horse before the cart two years ago, but uh, we've all dealt with a lot of evidence on this commission and in other forum, and we have the evidence we have. I know that Mr. Harrison doesn't find it credible. I don't have uh, contrary evidence to say that it's not credible, and um, and so I'm 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 prepared to accept the scientific analysis presented by the geologists and the consultants as to the necessity for the uh, remediation of the landslide. 
Well, before you make that motion, Matt, can I ask, um, what does that do to, um, I guess, the documentation that we need to send to the council? Um, I Two points. One, I understood the motion was made, so we're awaiting a second. And then right. second, um, second, no pun intended, I understand it to be a direction to staff to take the existing Exhibit A as is drafted and adjust it as needed to account for approval of a project at 135 units with the direction, and this would be an added um, condition number one, that the uh, project plans shall be revised and to be reviewed and approved by the director uh, to accommodate 135 units, that additional reduction with the direction to do so, minimizing aesthetic impacts to the maximum, maximum extent possible and then with direction, because that would be a reduction in density uh, with further direction to staff to port over the no net loss findings that were prepared for the denial that also would support a, a, an approval at a lower density to port those over and um, approve that as well. So that would be, to sum up, it'd be a, an adoption of exhibit A, the approval resolution with those adjustments. And staff, in, in, um, to answer the next question, at this time, staff would propose, uh, of course, subject to the commission's concurrence, that staff make those make those changes and bring it forward direct to the city council without returning back to this commission because it is modification to an existing resolution. That sounds good. Um, all right, is there a second for this motion? I'll second it. All right, so let's uh, discuss the motion uh, further if, if any is needed. Um, let's see. Commissioner Milstein. Oh, Bob Leah, yes, go ahead. Which one? Uh, yeah. I get, you had your I, hand up, I'm sorry. Okay. You had your That's hand a, up. Not a problem. Uh, Commissioner Mueller, what's the difference between recommending B to the council with a recommendation to do what you're suggesting? Wouldn't that be more motivational to get this thing done? I, I, I guess I'm not clear. In other words, recommend a denial. Denial with the recommendation that they come back with what you had suggested. Well, um, I mean, I suppose that's just the flip side of what I've suggested. Uh, um, I, I, I'm not in favor of a, of a flat out denial recommendation with a footnote that says, but you can approve the way I've suggested it. I, I, I like the way I, I set it up, but I agree with you in the sense that I think, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, even if we, even if my motion passes, city council still has exhibit B with all the findings that are set forth therein, if that's what they want to do. Yes, but they watered down because we didn't approve it. Well, we didn't, well, we're not watering down B. Well, I think B needs a lot more things in it, actually. And that may be. Yeah, the city council would retain all options as this is just a recommendation. I understand. City council would have all options. Okay, then anything else, Bob, or we can go to Mr. Um, I have a question about: uh, is, oh. Are we required to certify the EIR? It would be uh, to baked in Exhibit A. The recommendation for approval is recommending certification of the EIR. The final certification decision also falls to the council. So John's suggestion that we send Exhibit A or Resolution um, 713 with the reduction in units and a caution about the visual impacts of the project would be the way to go? Um, we're that would be an option. It doesn't bother <laughs> me to answer the question directly, but it would be an option, yes. And it would include, as proposed, sort of recommending that the council certify the EIR. Ms. May I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Sure. Of, of uh, Mr. Summers um, on the EIR, uh, if is there any mechanism in which we could say the EIR needs to be uh, reevaluated for purposes of, let's just say, the sole issue of the uh, fire impact? It's inadequate, but can be made adequate, provided that it is uh, revised to address that issue. Or does that require then recirculations and another hearing with us? What, what would that do? 
if the commission were to recommend that the council um, find the EIR mostly adequate, except as to fire, then the council, should they agree, would need to direct staff to revise the EIR to better analyze the fire impacts that have been discussed tonight and previously. That would require recirculation. It would require new comments, new rounds of hearings. Um, there, there's not, there's not a way to uh, amend an EIR without, at that level, without <laughs> recirculation, uh, and thus without new public hearings. Right. That's what I thought. So, so Dennis, the answer would be yes. The motion would include certification of the of the EIR as present as presently constituted. Or recommending approval of the CIR. Recommended. Uh, yeah. Right, I'm sorry, recommend. And again, and it's it's a council decision on all three counts here, so. Anything else, Commissioner Leah? I, I could not support that. Uh, Commissioner Milstein, we haven't heard from you. I, I actually liked Commissioner Muir's um, option to reduce the amount of housing a little bit and um, you know, the aesthetics not so apparent from the street from Las Virginas. I think a key issue is ultimately, Michael, um, that we you know, move on all the work that's been done and clearly all the comments that have been made by you and me and everybody who's spoken tonight and last week, all that is in the record, but it's up to the council to determine what level of um, development, what level of risk, as well as, you know, what level of, um, I guess, liability coverage, because I, I listened to Bob, your comments very clearly, you're, you're talking about public safety as well as fire safety. Yes. And public safety has to do with, you know, moving people through a circulation uh, plan and all the other stuff as well. So, you know, public safety is clearly in this instance, you know, uh, heavily ruled by the experience we all had with the Woolsey fire and all the other fires. I've been through a lot of them here and, um, you know, we're doing the best we can with what we got. I think that um, sending the, the package essentially exhibit A or resolution 713 with John's recommendations for a reduction in number of units and a, uh, a relook at the visual impacts uh, mitigation uh, that's sufficient to open the door to at least deal with public safety, be it traffic or you know, law enforcement or fire safety or evacuations and, um, and dealing with conflagrations, flood, landslide. Uh, I just don't know how you can all ignore the fact that the EIR is inadequate on fire hazard analysis, completely lacking and arrogant actually, when it says it's built to code. And I don't know how you can ignore that development's not permitted in the OSDR zone and development includes all those drainage structures. It's just prohibited by law. I just don't know how you can violate the law. And I don't know how you can re say that that traffic analysis is credible. I've driven that. I don't even live over there and I've driven that. And I, it's totally not credible that, that that is somehow going to improve traffic when you're going to have a four-way signal and you're not going to have commercial. That's a lie that there's going to be commercial. It's not going to exist. We've seen so much commercial fa failure over there. And then and I don't... I just don't know how you can do it. It violates the scenic court ordinance. It violates the Las Virginia's gateway master plan. I don't know how you can violate all those laws and rules and say, eh, we recommend approval, but we'll reduce it 25%. I, I, I don't see how you can do it. You can, I mean, you can do it, but um, I guess I'll write to council with, with my uh, opinions. Cause last time when I asked Matt to present- We're recommending to the council that they come together. Yeah, last, last time though, when I asked Matt to present my uh, uh, comments to council and I gave it to him in paper, it never made it. We, we didn't get that anything was back for two the years. Was not final. No final decision was made by this commission. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have confidence that my, my comments will make it to them. So I'm gonna, I, I'll have to write it to them. But um, I'm really disappointed that you all think that you can just violate the law, the general plan, the development code, the scenic court ordinance, the Las Virginas Gateway Master Plan, 
uh, and I'm not sure even who you're who you're thinking about. There is no resident here, none. I heard hundreds of residents, not one person supporting this project, none. So I I, I don't know who who were you know trying to help here. Um, it's the only people supporting it were like the building industry and the applicant, and and that's it. So I I don't understand at all. But it, anyway, if you want to have a vote on it, we can have a vote. Or are we ready? No. Be as the commission may have exhausted their comments. Yeah. Do we want to go ahead, John? Well, just uh, in somewhat in response, Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chairman. I've said enough tonight to suggest that that the EIR is not perfect, um, clearly, and it wouldn't shock me if the council uh, reviewed all this and listened to our comments and came to a conclusion that it cannot be certified. But I don't think it's clearly one way or the other. I mean, I, I've, re I've reviewed the comments uh, to the EIR and the mitigation responses that are set forth therein. Um, and, you know, this, this I, I think it is certifiable, but it's certainly not perfect. I wish like heck that we had the time to require the applicant to uh, improve, the applicant and the city, I should say, to revise and improve the EIR to address the issues that we've all discussed. Um, but it's not just the EIR, by the way. It'll no, be thrown not. out. It'll be thrown out in two seconds by somebody like Judge Beckloff. He threw out a much bigger EIR than this one, on a on a city that didn't address the fire hazards. So uh, you know, th this is going to be thrown out by a judge. But I I still don't know how you can overcome the fact that it violates the law. It violates the general plan. It violates the development code. It violates the scenic corridor or ordinance. And it violates the Las Virginia's Gateway Master Plan, are, are which I guess are just guide, guidelines. But uh, how do you overcome the development in a non-developable area? Well, are you suggesting that no development can ever be done? No, here? no, I do believe development could be done here. I don't believe that that geologist last week at all. He's not credible. Jack Greg Burns is an engineering geologist. He's uh, he said it. Is, Greg Burns said it is developable. So, and there's an economic reason for them doing this. No, they can't develop in the OSDR zone. They can certainly develop in the plan, in the PUD zone and, and uh, commercial uh, mixed use or whatever it was in, in, in that area. That area could easily be developed and it could look like a village too. I mean, there is hope for this, pro for this parcel, but not with this project. And you can't develop, you're not permitted to develop in OSDR. You're go we're going to lose in court on that too. It's really, really clear. And staff made up some silly thing uh, about, you know, human occupation. It's not in the development code. It clearly defines development as including any kind of alteration of the, of the landscape. So uh, there's no chance we're going to, the city or the applicant's going to win in court on, on the OSDR development. I mean, two miles of drainage ditches that we're all going to have to look at, that's development. <clears throat> Like I said, if you can't even have a cable box, how can you have two miles of drainage ditches? So um, I don't understand how you're doing this or what your thinking is, how you can just approve things that are illegal, let alone fatal, you know, lethal. But um, OK, I mean, go ahead, make your recommendation and um, and it'll be thrown out. I mean, it's, we're going to spend a lot of money. It's actually going to go to court no matter what we do either side's going to go to court. So, but I'm confident that the EIR is inadequate. It's not even close to what they did in Centennial with, for a whole city. And that was thrown out. So anyway, you want to call for the a vote on it? I mean, well, I, I would like, a, you know, I, I guess a conclusive remark from our attorney, if, you, if we can get that, you know, where are we? I'm happy to cover a couple of points. It doesn't fall to me to knock down arguments by either side. Uh, one point I will note, however, is Calabas Municipal Code section 1716030, which is the text that is measure D as, as for which measure O dropped the sunset, includes in subsection B that amendments which facilitate any of the following, it, uh, let me get the quote right. Subsection A of this section shall not apply to three Amendments which facilitate any of the following land uses, colon, uses permitted in the PF, land use district, uses in support of open space uses, such as bus shelters, 
parking facilities and comfort stations, semicolon, and public utility facilities, e.g. antennae and pipelines. So the, the blanket statement that the OSDR zoning prohibits public utility facilities is absolutely false. However, no, actually it's not, Matt. If you look it up, it's actually specifically on. included in the chart. It says no public utility facilities in that chart on the OSDR zone. Take a look at it. But Measure D does not prohibit redevelopment. Uh, I'm not talking about Measure D. I'm just talking about the development code itself. It's absolutely prohibited. Measure no, no public utility structures whatsoever. It's right in that chart in the development code and not talking about the measure O. Take a look again. Measure D is clear. The public utility- Me Measure D doesn't override that. Measure D doesn't override the existing development code on, on what permitted uses there are in, in that OSDR zone. In the Sorry. event of a conflict, it absolutely does because Measure D was adopted by the voters, not by the city council. It doesn't say However, you can have public utility structures in an OSDR zone. It is consistent with that conclusion. It also, as noted by staff in a couple of places, public utility structures already exist in the OSDR zone. However, that's not the final question. The final question that this commission will have to recommend to the council, and of course the council will have to decide, is whether permanent grading to facilitate development is or is not consistent with the OSDR zone. That's the real question, not public utility facilities. The real question is whether permanent grading of open space areas without permanent structures, without permanent occupation, is or is not Actually, that's false too, Matt. False. Sorry, sorry, I have to interrupt. You're wrong on that. It says any grading. It doesn't say permanent grading. It says any grading is development, okay? Look again, page 339, title 17. Any grading is development. So it's not. Pro it's prohibited to do remedial grading in an OSDR zone. There, okay. I think I disagree, but you've heard my comment. No, I'm reading the definition, sorry. It says any grading is development. Any alteration of the landscape is development. Can you read that? I mean, you want me to read it to you again? Development means any grading, any grading, any construction activity, any alteration of the land, any alteration of the terrain contour, any alteration of the vegetation. All those things are development, and they're all prohibited in OSDR. No, they are not because OSDR is development restricted, not development prohibited. However, the point to note is that the key question for the commission on that question is whether or not the permanent grading of the OSDR area or the permanent remedial grading is or is not consistent with the, with the Measure D requirements as is baked in the motion on the table. The um, second sum up comment I'll make is that it would be, um, consistent in the motion to, as was done in prior projects, to direct uh, as that additional condition that the staff would review and um, con review appropriate plans to be conformed to 135 units, cutting it down to that proposed number of units. And I think that would be the end of my comments. Well, I, I have uh, one yes, question. What does the city attorney, what is the city attorney's view as to whether or not the grading in the uh, OSDR area is or is not development. That's an ultimate conclusion that would be improper for me to answer. Well, the city clearly thinks that it's not development, correct? The staff's position is that yeah. it is not prohibited by measure D nor prohibited by the open space development restricted requirements. That's right. not to answer the question whether it is or is not development. The well, question is, is it prohibited by the development restrictions? All right. May, well, the, may I may I point out something else from the general plan for the benefit of the commission? Since there's been citing of the general plan on this point, on page eight fifteen, in the section known as the general plan implementation chapter, at the bottom of the page, there's a section called resolution of competing objectives. It's the intent of the general plan. In, in essence, it's, it's the intent of the general plan to do a lot of things. It cannot have all objectives and all aspects of the plan be completely harmonious and in complete agreement. So there's inevitably gonna be some conflict. There are policies in this general plan that staff has reviewed and presented that conflict with the definition of development that's been cited by Commissioner Harrison, where competition or conflict between competing values results in, and I'm quoting now, in seemingly incompatible policies or implementation actions 
The general plan text often describes the relative priorities of the competing objectives. In the absence of such specific direction, city decision makers will be required to determine the relative priorities of the values upon which the policies or implementation actions are based and to act based on that determination. You've been given some completing informa competing information, conflicting information, if you will, from the general plan. That's how it's supposed to be resolved. The commission, in this case, can resolve it via some balance between the two or one outweighing the other, whatever you decide. Thanks, thanks, Tom. I, there's just one final comment I have to make on something Matt said that I find just kind of unsupportable in court. He said that measure O allows utilities and grading where the development code did not. And I think the people of the city of Calabasas would be shocked if they heard that, if they understood that, that measure O allows more development in open space than the development code. So, and I think a court would fine accordingly. But anyway, let's let let's just uh, vote if you want on this on this uh, motion. It's, we have a motion. It's seconded. Um, uh, all, do you want? Do we? Can we just do it by voice vote, or do we have to do it individually? Well, Given the likelihood of divided vote, that right? would restate the motion. And here I'll ask um, whoever's our clerk to call the call the names. Oh, okay. Matt, would you restate the motion? Uh, sure. As I understand the motion, it is to adopt Exhibit A, proposed resolution number 2021-713, with modifications to be a maximum 135 unit project, that is at 135, with direction to staff to um, uh, add a condition requiring preparation of plans at 135 units, structured to reduce the aesthetic impacts to the maximum extent possible, and to adjust the findings as necessary to accomplish that reduction in density to include porting over the no net loss findings from the proposed denial resolution and making other necessary changes. Right. Okay, you want me to call the vote, Mr. Chair? Sure, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Uh, Comm Commissioner Mueller. Aye. Commissioner, um, Chair Harrison? No. Commissioner Leah? No. Commissioner Washburn? Aye. Commissioner Milstein? Aye. The ayes take it three to two. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you, everyone. I mean, so much work has been put into this. It's just amazing. The staff has put in so much work. The applicant has put in so much work. The community has come out, come out and spoken so many times and written so many comments. Um, it's, I, I just, it, it's amazing. And, and uh, I'm so grateful that we live here where there's so much uh, participation. Um, I guess that's it for this item. The next item is uh, future agenda items and reports. Um, do we have a director's report? Um, we have a very short director's report. Uh, your next planning commission meeting will be on May 6th. Um, we have uh, an opening on the ARP. Uh, Vice Chair Harrison, you would know this role very well. We have two candidates for your consideration to fill a vacant position. So we'll have those interviews. And for those who have not been part of the interview, I think we'll pull out our old uh, slides of ugly buildings uh, since you only have two candidates and see what they think of the other, how to improve an ugly building. So that will be um, entertaining and we wish them both the best. The second thing you have on your plate is a brand new item. It's request from the city council based on a petition uh, by an individual that the council received to consider it an exception to the city short-term rental rules. Basically, this is for um, uh, Airbnb styled um, rentals within homes under a 30-day period. There's currently um, a ban in the city 
will explain to you the history of that, but the council is seeking your opinion as to whether or not uh, they should consider a relaxation. Can you um, bring us the Malibu uh, ordinance that they just adopted allowing limited um, short-term rentals? Because they just did I, that. I'd be happy to include that. I'll be working on the staff report for this cool. item and include that. Um, but those would be the two items currently on that agenda. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the 6th. I want to thank all of you for your work um, in the review of documentation for this project and um, wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Are there any reports from the planning commissioners? Nothing here. Nothing? I'm sure you're all looking forward to having a, a, a Chair Fastberg back uh, on May 6th. So, uh, but I want to thank you all for um, for the time and effort we've also had to put into this and the, the boxes that Dennis has moved and uh, that we've all moved and gone through. It's uh, been quite a laborious undertaking. But anyway, thank you all. Good evening. And we'll see you all on May 6th then. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.